Good morning, everyone. My name is Danielle McNichol. I'm General Counsel and Director for the Center of Leadership, and I want to thank you very much for coming for today's event. But before we get into some of the housekeeping, I have the extreme pleasure of introducing you to our president here, Dr. Chris Domes, and he would just like to welcome you to our wonderful campus here at Newman University. Danny, and thank you for uh, participating in this wonderful event. I think the uh, Center for Leadership does a terrific job. Several of you have been to other programs here at Newman University, and we continue to advance the, uh, the topics and agenda over the next uh, several months. And next year, you'll continue to see opportunities to return to Newman for other programs. So hopefully you or your staff or people you are connected with would, would return to uh, experience, these, experience these great um, really, I think, uh, learning opportunities for a community and others. So, as I was sharing with people, I just started here at Newman University, and it's been a wonderful transition, both here at the university and in the region. And my wife, Mary, and I have had the chance to get to know Delaware County and get to know uh, Philadelphia and the suburbs, and it's a wonderful place. And we've been so welcomed by so many, so we really appreciate being here and being present. And as you're thinking about fundraising and foundation work, and, and the, the topic is an interesting one because I was, as I was sharing with people, the world of uh, fundraising is changing so rapidly. And one of the things I think that, that I've experienced, at least in a short period of time, is this notion of collaboration and teaming up with community partners in finding resources and going to foundations and others to collaborate on particular fundraising opportunities. So it's great to gather here where you can connect with other people that may be working on some similar things. Uh, there may be some opportunities for collaboration and funding opportunities around these tables today. So I'm glad to see people connecting and having the opportunity to, again to, to get to know each other. So welcome to Newman University. I hope your hospitality has been Great, we have great faces in hospitality here at Newman University, so you're experiencing it firsthand. I hope you have a wonderful day. Um, I'm, I'm, a number of our staff here at Newman are present. We've got some folks from our advanced staff, uh, Christine and Kim. We also have uh, Bridget over here from our student affairs, the dean of our students, the dean of students is here today as well. So, uh, and I know others here to support the program. So I hope you have a wonderful day. I have to scoot off to some other meetings, but wanted to say hello and welcome everyone to Newman University. Thank you so much. Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you again for coming to the um, new trends in philanthropy, recent trends in trust, charitable giving, online giving grants, and funding. Uh, we're very excited about the group of experts that we have here today. Um, I'm excited to learn all of the different uh, new things that are occurring and how we're able to use those for our organizations moving forward. Uh, before we get started, just a couple of the housekeeping items. We'd like to thank our sponsors, the Knight Foundation, Crozier Keystone Community Foundation, Buchanan Ingersoll, Bellevue Communications, and Apple Walnut Cafe for the wonderful treats that we have today. So if we could thank everyone for the participants. Now, uh, just a brief review through the agenda that we have today. You will see on the bottom of that the website for the presentation materials. If you'd like to uh, review those again, that's at the newmanpublicsafety.com backslash philanthropy and grants. For the live stream, for those folks that would like to view this um, live, and you'll also be able to go back through and then view this a second time or have someone uh, on your staff view it, it'll be at uh, www.newman.edu. Uh, for additional information about uh, upcoming programs as well as the sponsorship opportunities, newmanpublicsafety.com, Twitter at Newman Leaders, hashtag Newman Leads. So uh, again, I just again that's all on the bottom of your uh, agenda. Today we'll, we will be taking a brief break from um, after the speakers have the discussions on their individual topics. You'll have the opportunity to ask questions of this group of experts. Really take advantage of that. 
Um, you, you don't often get um, the, the caliber of individuals here that are available to you to be able to answer the types of questions, um, certainly for free. So that's a very nice kind of opportunity. But so between 1140 and 1155, we will be taking a break. On the table in front of you, there are uh, index cards. Please, as you're going through, if you have questions, write those into the stand. I'll be walking through and collecting those cards so we can provide it to the panel for them to be able to ask and answer any questions that you may have. Um, we also have provided in your packet the upcoming jobs events that we have here at Newman. We run uh, resume writing workshops, interviews, uh, workplace professionalism 101. Those are for January and February. We also run the series again, then following up in, from March through May. So uh, feel free to check those out or check out our website with all the upcoming dates on those. Um, that's a nice opportunity to have a smaller group to have um, folks from your organization have a, a look at a resume, talk to them about um, etiquette in the workplace, and also talk about trying to find that job or, uh, frankly, you know, is your social media post the right kind of post? So it's, it's kind of a whole gamut of things, so it's an interesting group. Um, I, I would be remiss if I did not take, I have two infomercials, one I didn't expect, but one that I'm um, excited to talk to you about, and that is that Newman University is currently seeking applicants for an assistant director for annual giving. Uh, the position is a full-time position of an assistant director for annual giving. I have a copy of this available for anyone that is interested or the individuals, the wonderful woman in the back of the room, Chrissy, will has copies of those as well as if anyone is interested. It's also available at humanresources at newman.edu if you would like to um, check that out. So the, the second piece that I really would like to mention, and it's really a thanks to the community, and that is the Wardrobes for Work program that the Center for Leadership has been blessed to be able to put together. Uh, last year at this event, our December event last year, we decided to ask the members of the community to consider providing professional clothing, um, anything from business casual up to suits, um, to help individuals who are going back to work, going to work for the first time, or really looking for a different <coughs> job. And we put one cardboard box out front, um, and the response was overwhelming. Um, partners that wanted to uh, help us from the corporate level to the individuals that have called me time and time again to help, how can we help? So uh, last week we had our second open house where we gave out 1,500 pieces of clothing to members of the public. We have collected over 10,000 pieces of clothing, and we continue to grow it stronger and better. So the first thing I would ask you is if you have groups, individuals, anyone that's in need of those types of clothing, again, business casual up to formal suits, we provide three days worth of clothing. First day, um, your interview, your callback interview, and your first day of work. So please feel free um, to get my email, which is mcnichod at newman.edu to them, and we will arrange for them to be able to come in and receive clothing, again, free of charge for whatever that job opportunity may be. Or if you have groups, we'll again, we'll arrange for a time for them to come in and to receive those. Uh, I'm excited that one of our partners on the corporate level happens to be here today. Uh, Buchanan Ingersoll, um, and I would say Richard Fox and Buchanan Ingersoll was so very kind to put one of our large bins in their office and we've collected over 100 suits from them. So today I would like to honor them with one of our plaques. If you could come up please, Richard, for our Excellence in Leadership Award to Buchanan Ingersoll and Rooney PC for its generosity in helping professionals of all walks of life to meet their full potential. Thank you so much, Buchanan <laughs> So now on to the program itself, everyone. I'm very excited to introduce to you Patrick, Patrick Morgan of the Knight Foundation. He is the program director and the specific name of the foundation is the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation. 
He leads the investment strategy in Philadelphia, working with local leaders and other community members to find and invest in opportunities to build the city's vibrancy. Um, prior to that, and I'm going to throw this out there for him, he also was a member of the leadership for Mayor Michael Nutter's administration, including Chief of Staff to the Deputy Mayor for Environmental and Community Resources and Assistant Managing Directors. So Philadelphia and the Knight Foundation are in great shape. Um, we look forward to uh, hearing your comments. Please welcome to Thank you, thank you for that. Sorry. I'm uh, fighting through a cold. Um, I guarantee none of you can get it because we have uh, three year old twins at home and a 19 month old. So uh, <laughs> we have three patient zeros at home. So, um, so thanks everyone for, for coming out. Really appreciate it. And I thought what I could do in the, in the limited amount of time that I, that I have. Um, is just give a little bit of cover of the of the Knight Foundation, and then maybe through as kind of the umbrella or talking about trends in philanthropy, really talk that through in terms of what we're funding and in our partnerships, because I think ultimately that that probably does the best to demonstrate what are some trends, at least from it's only from our perspective, one one foundation's perspective. So. Just a little bit of cover. The, the Knight Foundation um, is a, a private national foundation started by, by these gentlemen, Jack and, and James Knight. Um, they made their, their money uh, off of newspapers. Um, so they own newspapers in around 26, 27 different cities uh, across the country. Um, and, and their mandate to, to the foundation was essentially this. They wanted to support informed and engaged communities in the communities where, where they own newspapers. Um, and I think what, these are some of the things that they, they would really hold dear and that we try to kind of carry throughout as guiding principles for the foundation. And, and I think they're, they're most manifest in something that Jack Knight would say, which is an informed community was in the best position to make their own decisions. Um, so I think a lot of what we do and a lot of what we fund, uh, whether it's in journalism and in, in Philadelphia, I think Richard's going to speak to this a little bit, uh, but we're supporting a, a new model called the, the Lenfest Institute uh, with some partners on the ground, uh, Jerry Lenfest, the Wincote Foundation, um, and, and some other partners to really kind of look at a new model for promoting collaboration on, on the journalism side. Uh, we're also a supporter of the, of the arts. Uh, we're actually a, a very large national arts funder. Uh, and, and I think specifically we're, we're interested in supporting uh, diversity within the arts, both within kind of artists themselves, but then what, what is the art? And then the concept of kind of art as an attachment to place, uh, whether it be in a neighborhood or a place like a library or public asset. And then tech innovation is something that I think cuts across our, our four funding strategies. And I think that started from exploring digital trends within, within media and, and actually the shift from uh, more paper journalism to more online, online business models. And then lastly, it's, it's the community side, which is specifically in, in Philadelphia um, where, where I run the, the Philadelphia office. And to say office, it's two people. Uh, it just sounds better to say office uh, than, than two people. So um, I actually have to, to cut out a little bit early because it's our, our year end. Uh, and when you're kind of a one person shop, uh, there's no one else who I can. So I'll be taking a call in, in your parking lot. Um, but the, these, are the, these are the 27, uh, 27 cities that, that we invest in. Uh, and again, my specific focus is, is in Philadelphia. We are, we are based in, in Miami. Uh, and again, these, these closely align to where the, where the Knight Brothers once owned newspapers. Uh, in Philadelphia, that would have been the Evening Bulletin, uh, the Inquirer, and, and the Daily News. And I think most people know the Knight Foundation either through our support of public media, uh, if you listen to NPR, WHYY, uh, or if you know the Knight Ritter, um, the Knight Ritter brand. Uh, I think one of the things that we're really known for, and, and again, I think is a trend in philanthropy, um, is we do something, we do a number of challenges. Um, and it first started on the media side where we would do the night news challenge. Um, and, and our challenges are national. And, and this one is the night cities challenge, which is specifically within my, my community bucket. 
Excuse me. And and essentially, with the with the Night Cities challenge, I think the the trend that it demonstrates is that philanthropy being open to to ideas that are authentic to communities. So essentially, with the Night Cities challenge, we make available a pot of five million dollars across our 27 cities. We've been doing it now for for the past three years. And essentially, the question we ask is: Give us your best idea to make your city, uh, you know, more more livable and connected. And, and that's it, basically. Um, and I think that the challenge is it's it's infuriatingly open. Um, and and I think that is a that's a, a burgeoning trend within philanthropy is just to be to be receptive and open to people's ideas. Um, the the other thing that we're that we're looking to do through the challenge is to be catalytic. So the grants are 18 months. Um, so it's a limited amount of time. Uh, what you're seeing now are some photos of uh, one of the winners from Philadelphia uh, two years ago. It's called the Center for Hip Hop Entrepreneurship, um, and it's not about finding the next uh, Jay Z or, or Beyonce, uh, but it's about meeting people where they are and using the the lens or the industry of hip hop to teach entrepreneurial skills. Um, so this was a, a Night Cities Challenge winner, like I said, for Philadelphia two years ago. And I think the, the catalytic piece of this is both in terms of its visibility, it's been featured in Forbes and, uh, and Entrepreneur Magazine and, and City Lab, but then it's, it's also uh, producing uh, community-driven, community-run businesses in, in Philadelphia. Uh, the other catalytic grant that came through our Night Cities Challenge was something that Alex and, and Bellevue were actually working on. Um, this was also a winner from, from two years ago. The Reading Terminal Market uh, did a series of conversations called Breaking Bread, Breaking Barriers, um, where one of the reasons that Philadelphia is growing, or at least has sustained growth, is because of our foreign-born or immigrant population. Uh, and Reading Terminal, being the oldest public market in, in the country, really saw a need to essentially create a place for, for people to come together. So they worked uh, pretty extensively with a number of partners to, to bring together both, both new residents and, and um, you know, more established Philadelphians to, to really talk about, um, you know, some, quite frankly, some difficult conversations. Uh, and I think in, in light of, uh, of recent events as well. Um, there was one that was, some of the photos you're seeing where, where our mayor, Jim Kenney, came out, um, was actually the day after the Trump administration passed, uh, I think, the first, um, the first travel ban. It actually brought Syrian refugees and residents from our Mayfair community together. And I think the, the catalytic piece we're seeing from this is that it, it is really, it, it's changing, I think, the narrative and it's putting power back into communities that it is possible to come together. Um, it is possible to, to not look like each other and have conversations. And it's possible to have difficult conversations. And, and we're doing it, and, and we're doing it in cities, and we're doing it specifically in, in Philadelphia. Uh, another grant that we did was the first year of the challenge was actually called the, the Pop Up Pools. Um, so this, what you're looking at, is a is a is a rec center in Philadelphia. This this is a place where I don't know anyone in this room. Would you send your kids here? Probably not. Um, so with the with the grant that we did through the Night Cities Challenge, um, we were able to, from a community driven design effort, uh, able to do some relatively simple design interventions to to really. Uh, bring the bring the rec center and the pool up to the standard of a of a private pool, and and the, the catalytic feature of this was both on a on a large citywide scale. Uh, actually, the Parks and Rec Department for the city actually adopted this program, uh, was able to create a low cost model, and has now spread it out to half a dozen pools all across Philadelphia. And next year is thinking of doubling that. And actually, I was in New York City meeting with their commissioner, Mitch Silver, and New York City is thinking about adopting this model. Um, and, and also, from a community perspective, it, it really did signal an investment in, in the people who, who, were, who were using this facility when it was just mostly concrete, um, and, and, it, and it really took off. I think an, another trend that, that kind of comes through in a national uh, partnership that we're doing is called Reimagining Civic Commons. Um, this is a partnership that started in Philadelphia with, uh, with the William Penn Foundation. Um, so I think a trend in philanthropy that I think probably a number of the speakers are going to talk to is, is partnerships, um, especially for philanthropy that's working in cities. I think 
both the challenges and the opportunities are, are, are so apparent that no one can, can do it alone, uh, either as a private foundation, a community foundation, a, a city government, uh, corporate social responsibility. We all need to be kind of coming together and, and linking up and pooling resources. So um, that's what we're doing with the reimagining civic commons. It was a pilot initiative started in, in 2015 between Knight and the William Penn Foundation. And it, it's really, it, it's about um, using public spaces, uh, neighborhood public spaces, so rec centers, uh, public libraries, parks, trails, things like that, as, as a way to have communities exercise their civic muscles and as a way to have community be at the same table with, with local decision makers that, that they trust, that they feel like authentically um, take their take their input into account when they make decisions. Um, I think the other unique trend in philanthropy that comes through in our reimagining civic commons partnership is it's not just an investment in capital. Um, so we are making capital investments in terms of a new trail or a new park or a, a, a new a new or a re rehab library. Uh, but we're also making investments in in people and and process. So it's a it's a multi-year initiative, multi-dimensional uh, investment in place, people, and process. Um, and I think the, the place or the people and, and process investment comes through in, in what we built into this, which is called the Civic Commons Collective. So we do a number of things where we are investing in not just the people who are working at, these, at the libraries or the rec centers or the public facilities, but we are bringing them together with, with community that are surrounding these places, um, you know, either have historically uh, you know, not felt like they've been a part of the, of the asset or have actually been, been cut off from it um, via a number of policies. Um, that have kind of occurred in the past, either industrialization, segregation, things like that. So we're really trying to reconnect the, these assets with the communities in a very authentic way. Uh, we're also trying to make investments in, in the process um, so things aren't as siloed uh, in terms of, a, from a citizen's perspective, you know, they go to a library, they go to a rec center, they go to a park, it's all one experience. But on the back end, it's very siloed. It's, it's bureaucratic, there are different budgets, um, and, and a lot of times competing uh, against each other uh, when, it, when it comes to budget season. So one of the things that we're trying to do is create space uh, for these partners to, to collaborate, to learn from each other, to pool resources. And I think that's another trend in foundation is you just can't invest in, in place uh, you have to invest in, in people as well and, and in the learning process that comes from it. And I think one of the things that, that Knight does, which is a trend in, in, in foundations, at least that I'm seeing, is you know, we, we invest in collaboration. And we know collaboration is a slow process. Uh, we also provide risk capital. Um, so I'm, I'm relatively new to philanthropy, but I'm, I'm very surprised by, by how we don't talk about failure. Um, and, and I think one of the things that, that we try to do is say, first of all, it's okay to fail. Um, and once, once failure does happen, let's have an honest conversation and really dig into why it happened and let's see how we can learn from that uh, so we can fail fast but, but keep moving. I think one of the things that's been catalytic from this, again, another theme is it's now gone national. Um, so again, back to this theme of, of partnerships, four national funders have come together to, to spread this to, to four other cities, two of which are, are Knight Cities, Akron and, and, and Detroit. And we are placing Philadelphia as part of a national conversation around the role of, of public spaces, especially as, as Philadelphia is, a, is, is growing and has now 10 years of sustained growth. Um, can these public spaces really be platforms for people to, to um, envision the, the Philadelphia of the future that, that they feel a part of? Um, so it's really interesting what we're, what we're doing in terms of the, the Civic Commons conversation and, and doing that now on, on a national level with, with, five, with five other cities as well. Um, and then these are just some of the other themes that I really kind of pulled out um, from the work that we're, what we're trying to do within Knight, I think I've kind of hit on, hit on some of them already. Um, I think one of the biggest trends that I found, at least in philanthropy, and again, I think it goes back to 
um, taking risk is, is really being open to listening. Um, I think one of the more dangerous things that can happen in philanthropy is when you try to force something. Um, so I think a, a lot of what I'm seeing, at least in terms of a trend, is, is how can we really be as open as we can be uh, to, to people's ideas that, that are, again, authentic to what's happening, what's happening on the ground. So um, that, that is it for me. Was that 20 minutes? Okay, Alex is giving me a thumbs up, so <laughs> thank you very much. Our next speaker is Frances M. Sheehan. She's the first president of Delaware County's Large Philanthropy, the new Crozier Keystone Community Foundation, an independent public foundation formed with the sale of Crozier Keystone Health System July, on July 1st of 2016. She came to the foundation in January 2017 after serving as the founding president and CEO of Brandywine Health Foundation in Coatesville, Chester County for 15 years. And uh, we're very excited to hear from Francis the new opportunities um, and the uh, foundation projects at this time. We welcome Francis. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. No, I think I'm okay, Alex. I think I can manage this. It's nice and tight, which is great. So, thank you all so much for giving me the opportunity to speak with you here today and. And Patrick, you and I are very much along the same lines about collaboration and the importance of getting the community engaged in so many opportunities in the philanthropic world right now, I think particularly because there's so much more of an emphasis on listening and learning and bringing the community together to listen and learn together. So um, first of all, I'll just start by saying that I really do hope we'll have a good conversation today because for those of us who are speaking, you came here to hear us, but I know I came here very much to learn from you, and I hope after we've had an opportunity to speak that we'll have a really good conversation after the break. Um, we, are, we are the new public foundation serving Delaware County, and I'll tell you a little bit, I, I've lived in this community for 27 years, um, which means that you know, I raised my, my husband and I raised our children here, we uh, went, they went to public school, we belong to the synagogue just east of here, we have lots of friends in this community, we shop at Giant and Trader Joe's and BJ's, and we can tell you all about what it's like to live in Delaware County, but we both, and he still, have worked in Chester County for the last 30 years, so almost 30 years. So I've, I know all about the nonprofit community and the funder community out there. I can tell you all about how to get from Phoenixville to Oxford. But I'm only just learning how you get from Upper Darby to Chester. And if you really want to know, you follow Joanne Craig, who's our VP for programs. And I cannot tell you where she took me, but uh, we were down through all sorts of, of back roads. And it's been a complete pleasure working here because I'm getting an opportunity to really uh, have a better understanding of what the nonprofit community like is here uh, is like here and several of you in this room I've had an opportunity to sit down and learn about learn a little bit more about Widener, learn a little bit more about the community YMCA and and very very impressed with the quality of leadership and the quality of the nonprofits that we have here in this community and look forward to learning even more and I hope very much that you'll all be part of helping us envision what this new community foundation for Delaware County can be about. So we are, as I said, an independent public charity here to serve Delaware County. And I want to tell you a little bit about what that means uh, because every community foundation is a public foundation, but not every public foundation is a community foundation. So the, sometimes the foundation will include the words community and foundation in their name, but that does not mean they qualify as what's called a community foundation. There are over 780 community foundations around the country, and what they are characterized by is they are a um, collection of uh, individual community um, funds that are pulled together under a common governing instrument, a common board, and that governing board has what's called variance power. So when an individual places funds with us, it is our responsibility to honor the nonprofit 
um, honor the IRS obligations, the nonprofit, um, the charitable obligation of that donor. So if the donor passes away, or the needs that that donor sought to meet go away, or the nonprofits that that donor sought to serve go away, it's up to the governing board of that entity to make sure that the original intent of the donor is honored and that the charitable obligations of that donor are honored. So unlike the original Delaware County Community Foundation, which I think some of you are probably familiar with, we have the luxury that we're not starting from scratch. Uh, that, that they tried to start um, a community foundation without having any assets or programs. We have the luxury of inheriting over $55 million to start with, and we have the luxury of inheriting the public health programs of the original health system. So although we are completely separate from the health system, please don't let the name confuse you, uh, we inherited the programs that Joanne runs, Joanne Craig runs, Healthy Start, the Nurse Family Partnership, the Women's Infants and Children's Supplemental Nutrition Program, the WIC Program, they all report to me uh, via Joanne. And we're very excited because it means we're operating out of four, four different offices around Delaware County. And we know so much already about what the needs of the community are and how to ideally serve them and who are the good nonprofits that we need to be partnering with. So because we're not starting from scratch, we can start almost from day one with a strong grant making program, which we'll be launching next year, but also with an effort to meet the 26 quality standards that the Council on Foundations, US Community Foundations has set forth as being critical for community foundations to meet. And that has to do with board governance, the quality of your grant making program, how engaged you're getting your community, uh, whether or not you're meeting a strong, you have a strong fundraising program, uh, are your financial operations one that really set the standard so that donors can trust you to place their funds with. So we hope to be meeting those standards within the next year. They're very lengthy and copious and lots of documents, but that is one of our goals, and the reason is because we feel that Delaware County deserves the very strongest, highest quality community foundation. But community foundations are not just uh, philanthropic financial instruments. They are about creating change and they're about engaging their communities and having as much impact as possible in improving that community. In Delaware County, we've begun with a commitment to do, as I said, the very best job with the public health programs we've already in inherited. We also, our grant making program will place a very heavy emphasis on improving the health and well-being of children in Delaware County but we'll also be looking beyond to impact programs where we can leverage our resources to have an even greater impact. And we plan on encouraging civic engagement, uh, convening, advocating, and advising donors and businesses and other funders about how to invest in Delaware County. We have already convened um, two meetings of a Delaware County funders group, and we'll be convening a third meeting in, uh, in January. I was very active in the Chester County uh, Funders uh, Collaborative, and I cannot imagine how I would do my job without regularly getting together with other funders, not just located in Delaware County, but who uh, may be located in Philly, but serve the entire, um, serve Delaware County with their, with their grant making. We um, also have already um, uh, expressed our concerns and we'll be actively advocating for our clients. We've expressed our concerns about the fact that CHIP and WIC and the McVie Home Visiting Programs have not been reauthorized, which is really a travesty. Every five years these programs were reauthorized with strong bipartisan support, but somehow these really critical programs that serve our children uh, in Delaware County are caught up in the uh, political morass that we're seeing down in um, Washington, D.C. And I was honored uh, this week to attend a press conference at CHOP that Congressman Meehan spoke at about how critical CHIP is for so many working parents in, in Delaware County's children. We um, also piggybacked with the Knight Foundation and with the Philadelphia Foundation on their On the Table initiative. Uh, we uh, co-hosted with uh, organizations in Delaware County three uh, On the Table events, which were an effort to bring together 
uh, um, people in the community to have a conversation about what they thought the needs were. Um, it was a great first effort. We collected a lot of information about um, what people's concerns are, the kind of people who come together at these events and are very hopeful that Knight and the Philadelphia Foundation will um, will uh, have on the table com uh, conversations again next year and that we'll have an opportunity to do that again in, in Delaware County. But we're still a new, so despite all these things that I've been telling you, we're still brand new. I, I just began in January and um, that's why when I received a phone call about six weeks ago from a woman in the community who was interested in setting up a donor advised fund with us, I was really surprised. And not because I didn't think that we could do a great job for her, because I, I think we can, but because we are so new. And the donors, I'll just tell you a little bit about them and, and what their story says about trends that we're seeing in philanthropy uh, right now. Uh, they're young, they're 50, um, that's young to me, not young to some of you in this room, but as donors who are really thinking philanthropically, that's, that's relatively young. They're very new to the philanthropy world. Um, they've been very focused on building their careers, but they're now at a point where they really want to create a philanthropic legacy for their family. Very grateful for the opportunity they have to do that and they want to get their teenagers involved. They're not sure how, um, but they were speaking with their financial advisor and they just assumed that they would put their funds with uh, Vanguard or Fidelity or Schwab or one of the other philanthropic, one of the other financial firms that have started to um, uh, market uh, donor advised funds. And thankfully, their advisor, who's not even in Pennsylvania, said, well, you know, I wonder if you have a community foundation in your backyard because you will get the same tax deduction, but you will get much more personal service from a group of people whose job it is to really know your community and know the needs and know which nonprofits are really having an impact. And what, as I said, what struck me about this conversation was what it says about trends in the field that we're seeing right now. The first trend is that the wife drew, drove the philanthropic decision. Uh, she, women now control more than half of U.S. wealth and are projected to inherit over 70% of the wealth transfer in the next uh, 30 years. And in fact, in just eight years, women will be 60% of U.S. billionaires. That's right. That's millionaires with a B, folks. 60% of U.S. billionaires by the year 2025 will be women. And women, oh, if you look at baby boomers and old, the older generation, women are 89% more generous with their philanthropic do dollars than men. That is not a negative. It is really very much because of what, how women are motivated differently in how they give. They very much, historically, this may very much change for the next generation of men, but for women, they're very much motivated by how good they feel when they make a difference. They look very carefully at whether or not organizations are having an impact. They really plan their philanthropy very carefully. Men, historically, have tended to be a little bit more transactional. How is this philanthropic decision going to help my business, for instance? So that's something I think you need to be very, very aware of because it means really stepping back if you are running a nonprofit and saying, okay, am I communicating only with the guy, you know, the husband? Do I need to pull the wife more into the transaction? Maybe I'm not paying enough attention to the single women or the women in my organization, and maybe I need to think more carefully about the kinds of events and the kinds of uh, inter individual interactions that I'm having to, to build my philanthropic program. Not only was the family's decision um, driven by the wife, but the other trend we're seeing was that instead of even thinking about setting up a family foundation, they looked to set up a donor advised fund. And we are seeing more and more people just do not want to deal with the paperwork, the IRS obligations, worrying about a, the back office of setting up a family foundation. They, rec they really want to focus on their philanthropy and by putting their funds with a community foundation they have the opportunity to really keep that first and foremost 
with their time and their energy. And we're even seeing that people who set up a family foundation years ago are turning to their local community foundation and asking them to manage that family foundation for them. The other trend we've seen is businesses um, that have a charitable giving program or considering setting up a charitable giving program turning to their community foundation, very much similar to what Mr. Lanfest did with this, his new newspaper um, enterprise, was turning to the Philadelphia Foundation and saying, hey, you know, run this institute for me because um, setting up a whole new structure um, didn't make any sense. Uh, the business still gets the um, visibility and the marketing, they are the face of the charitable contributions, but behind the scenes the community foundation is running it for them in an efficient and informed way. So that's very exciting to see. I think it's a trend I hope will continue. Um, but I, I also want to comment that it's, it's, it's not that, um, uh, well, I would just say that I think that the more that people turn to their community foundations rather than simply parking funds at a financial firm like Fidelity or Vanguard. They'll do a great job for you, it's efficient, um, you order the checks, they move them out the door, but you're not part of building your community. And I think that's really critical to really think about how these community foundations can have such a bigger impact than any removed financial financial firm can have. And we've seen that with the Philadelphia Foundation, we've seen it with the, the Pittsburgh Foundation, we've seen it with the Chester County Community Foundation, Berks County, very exciting efforts to really energize communities, bring them together, enable everybody to become a philanthropist. Some concerns I do want to raise because they are also uh, represent trends. One is that we are extremely concerned about some of the changes in the tax bills that have been proposed on both the House and the Senate side. Uh, our understanding is that they'll be going into conference. The Senate um, will probably have more clout in the interaction, and I don't want to steal either Richard or Josh's um, comments because they, they can, I'm sure, speak to you in more detail. But the possible elimination of the estate tax is of great concern to us. Back in 2009, 2010, when the estate tax went away, we saw a 20% dip in charitable giving. We also have a concern about the impact of the doubling of the individual um, uh, your individual write-off because it means more and more people will not be itemizing and therefore may not be as motivated to make charitable gifts. And you may not have heard about the repeal of the Johnson Amendment. You may not have even heard of what the Johnson Amendment is. But those are the regulations that keep nonprofits from becoming too engaged in the political process. And the repeal of that, our fear is that it will really drag nonprofits into the political scrum which I don't believe can be good for the process at all. I think the nonprofit community has done, just done such an excellent job of sort of staying above the fray. We advocate for and educate elected officials about the, the issues of our, you know, the needs of our clients, but we don't get into the nitty gritty of elections and, um, and, and we're not pressured by our donors to do so. So that is a real concern to me, and if you have an opportunity to commu with, communicate with your legislators, please learn more about that, and uh, I, think, I think that's something we need to be very worried about. Um, so the, the, the other concern we have is related to another trend, and that is the increasing accessibility of uh, data that can be used for planning purposes. So with the 2010 census, uh, a lot of foundations invested in developing online platforms that enable anybody with minimal computer skills to get really good data about their community. So for example, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation's Culture of Health Information. We have on our website um, a, a link that drives you to how healthy is Delaware County. Uh, free information out there. They've invested heavily in, in a uh, site called Community Commons. I had a high school graduate in this summer who developed fabulous maps, collected all sorts of da data off of community comments about what the health needs are of people in Delaware County. And we're seeing and, uh, more and more funding driving down into census level information that is incredibly helpful for economic development specialists, 
um, municipalities, community development folks, nonprofits, foundations, who can now use information that you previously might have had to pay, that either wasn't accessible at all, or you would have had to pay a lot to get. And the reason, so that's a trend we're seeing. The concern we have is that we're not far away from the 2020 census. And there is some concern that the same funding and resources will not be invested in collecting the same information um, in three years. So pay attention to that issue because you're going to see some organizations and funders coming together to address that concern. Once the census is over, you can't go back. This is really critical information for all of us, I think. So the, the last trend I do want to mention is um, that I want to touch on, and I think Josh is going to talk a little bit about this too, is obviously increasing use of technology. Uh, this is such a, a significant pressure issue for nonprofits in our community because it's expensive. Uh, having the right software to manage your donors, having the right software to manage um, you know, this whole variety of different, you know, your clients, your visitors, and that cost hits your bottom line. It hits administration and development and impacts your administration and development um, percentage number, and yet it's critical you have to have it. It also means increasing competition for, for um, getting the word out about your work. So, for instance, the increasing use of GoFundMe sites and Indiegogo sites and it, not only can everybody become a philanthropist within a community foundation, but nowadays everybody can become a fundraiser. And probably the best example of that recently was you probably all saw the story about the young woman who ran out of gas and the homeless man went and got her gas and now they've raised over $350,000. Now, thankfully, this man is working with the family to plan, you know, to talk about what are the nonprofits that have helped him that he wants to invest some of that money back into, which I think is fabulous. But that means that $350,000 went to that one man and his, and the, and the generous young woman who started that site, and it may not have gone to some of you. So you've got to make sure that you're informed and that you're really thinking strategically about how you're going to compete with or use some of those new platforms. Wonderful show of generosity, but you know it's, it's a significant issue to pay attention to. So in summary, I, I invite you all to pay attention to what sorts of trends we're seeing in, in the philanthropic world, uh, the increasing role of women, the uh, availability and need for the absolutely best data to do our work, uh, the need to pay attention to legislation that may impact philanthropy in Delaware County, and the increasing complexity of technology. But I also invite you to work with us as we build what I think is an incredible opportunity for Delaware County, a foundation for Delaware County that can really take us in some, in, to some places that I can't even imagine. The sky is the limit. I invite you to fly with us, and now I think I'm turning the program back over to Danny. Thank you so much, Francis. Uh, next to speak um, is Richard Fox. Um, he is counsel and shareholder with Buchanan Ingersoll and Rooney. Um, we've had the privilege of having Richard speak um, here at the Institute prior to this. And I would also tell you that uh, one of the things that Richard will tell you today, and I will go through, he has a fantastic bio, he's got an LLM in taxation, he's a fellow of the American College and Trust Estate Council, um, he's an author of many treatises that, um, honestly, if, if I read them close to bedtime, they really help me go to sleep. Um, but it's wonderful work. I, I say that sort of tongue-in-cheek, and he knows that. Um, he'll, he'll say that to you as well. Um, and has had some fantastic clients. But one of the other things I will tell you, and he will say this, um, he offers advice regularly to um, groups, um, not-for-profits, and uh, he is, is a, a very approachable individual. Uh, we had, uh, I had a calling for him on a client, uh, one that was near and dear to my heart, we were meeting of families, and uh, Richard took up the, uh, he, he was immediately there to help us. So I will tell you that uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Richard Fox uh, to the podium.
you very much, Danny. Can everybody hear me? Great. Just add a few points uh, to Francis's comments. Uh, I've been a supporter of community foundations my entire career. Uh, I've worked with community foundations all over the country. And it's interesting how when I have a donor approach me, and one of the main things that I do is advise donors, such as Jerry Lentfess with the Inquirer, is to you know, look at alternatives for them. And some of those alternatives do not result in me doing a lot of legal work. And so if I turn it over to a community foundation, the community foundation takes over, which I have no problem with. As Josh Hadley, my, uh, my colleague, will tell you, the, the, the needs and best interest of the clients uh, guide us. Correct, Josh? I'm not saying that we uh, may not do the work we otherwise would, uh, would, would do. And that's fine with us. We have plenty of work. Uh, but one thing to, to keep in mind about the community foundation is it's not all about donor advice funds. It's a minor, it's, it's a major thing, but in all, for all intents and purposes, it's, it's a minor. I work with community foundations, including with the Annenberg Foundation. Does everybody remember Walter Annenberg and the Annenberg Foundation? Yeah, this, this is Philadelphia. If they, we were in uh, Wyoming, people wouldn't be so, uh, you know, nodding their heads. But Walter Annenberg, he basically started out in, in, in Linwood and created TV Guide. And TV Guide was kind of like uh, uh, you know, Microsoft software. Uh, it was selling 25 editions a week you recall, and generating millions and billions of dollars and ultimately sold to Rupert Murdoch uh, during the course of the cocktail party for billions and billions of dollars. And one third of that went to his foundation because he contributed money to his foundation. So I view, I would say that community foundations should be viewed as the power of the community foundation so that when you're looking at doing, whether it's a donor or a nonprofit, talk to the community foundation. There's a lot of help they can give you, a lot of advice they can give you. And I've used them, and even the Android Foundation has, has worked with Pew, William Penn, to create a donor by fund, a restrictive agreement, because they viewed the expertise of the community foundation as being something they could use that they weren't able to do. So, you know, I think it's very important to keep in mind the community foundation. Although, I have to say, you know, what, what is the second largest charity in the United States at this point? I believe it's Fidelity Charitable Gift Fund. And there's a place for that, too. Um, where, you, where it's just a generic, generic grant making and you don't want anybody's help, you want to write checks, you want to tax deduction, find your contribution. So I think it depends on whether you're going to use a community foundation versus a commercially sponsored donor by funds. Um, and a lot of charities don't even like me saying that name, commercially sponsored donor by funds. Um, but somehow they got in there and they have the muscle, the marketing muscle to, to, to move. So, uh, so again, I can't underestimate the, uh, the, the, the power of the community foundation, and it's not something you should overlook, including with restricted funds, and there's a boatload of, of situations where I've used community foundations, and it's worked out beautifully, and the donor, everybody's happy. Um, so when I, when I was asked to talk about new models of philanthropy, uh, basically what I did was I took a step back, and I said, well, let me, let me think about this. I just jotted down some, some, some topics. Uh, basically dealing with what I do in, in my practice with donors, with nonprofits, and I think everybody has a copy topics. And the topics are listed there. And if you want, we can expand this to two days. I'm not sure if people can stay that but well, probably not. So obviously we're not going to get into each one. Josh Hedley is available next week uh, for a full day seminar on that, so he'll be passing out a card for that, and there's no charge for that at all. Plus, I think you're also offering up free hotel rooms. <laughs> so, so you work that out with Josh. So it was interesting. When I put the topics together, and having this, this, this background, Walter Annenberg, Leonard Annenberg, and the Annenberg Foundation, which I started with when I was very, 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 very young at the time, um, and I was involved heavily in their philanthropy, I kind of started looking at what they did. And I thought, well, is there anything that they did that really relates to modern philanthropy? And then I, then I kind of made a list. And I just wanted to go through that quickly before getting into the, the crux of the matter here. And, you know, Walter Annenberg's approach was always that where there's a will, there's a way. And he wasn't a uh, man who you said no to um, lightly, <laughs> you know, or you didn't work for him, ultimately. But the Annenberg Foundation, it's a Pennsylvania nonprofit corporation. Hey, 
when Mrs. Hanover passed away a couple of years ago, we moved to Los Angeles. Still sometimes to Philly, but not much. But it's a stock corporation. Most people don't know that a nonprofit corporation can be created as a stock corporation. Uh, so the stock corporation gets all around their powers, their this family at least, to vote the stock, their dividends and liquidation rights. It was a very kind of uh, novel approach to doing it. The Pennsylvania allows stock corporations. Um, but does that have any value? But if he told me, Richard, I'd love to give you the stock, you can't sell for value. With the Hanover Foundation, I would, would not hesitate and say, certainly. And I would name myself the director, and all of a sudden I'm ahead of <laughs> So, you know, so, but he put, it's interesting, he was a man, a uh, well head of his time, and he set up a trust years before he passed away, when he transferred the stock to a trust and said, this is how my foundation's going to be run. They're the trustees, they're going to be the directors, and it's very fascinating. So, with the stock issue, all I can think of is there is a model of philanthropy now that involves the issuance of stock where the charity receives money, real money. Not Adenberg, he wasn't issuing stock to people for money. He did it for playing purposes. Can anyone think of a, a charity that, that, that raised millions of dollars and what did the donor get? They got a certificate that they placed in gla under glass and they put it on their wall. No dividends and liquidation rights, nothing. Mueller? No, sorry. Uh, the Green Bay Packers. So it's an unusual charity that has the wherewithal that people are going to put up a thousand bucks for a certificate. But you have these diehard um, fans. So that was one of the fundraising things. That's, that's in the model of philanthropy. Issuance of stock. Doesn't give you any rights, but it's on your wall. Uh, so I thought that was something that was kind of related to Annenberg and, and the stock. Annenberg Foundation is a private foundation. Originally, it was called the Annenberg School for Communication. Private foundations are the worst type of tax exempt organizations possible. Your deductions are limited to tax basis unless it's appreciated stock. Well, Annenberg owns TV Guide. It's a closely held company. It can be worth $10 billion, but if the basis is a penny, you can deduct a penny. So it's very important for him not to be a private foundation. So we actually called this foundation the Annenberg School for Communication. We entered into a joint operating agreement years ago, well beyond the statute of limitations, in 2002. And it's all public knowledge. It's not like any way trade secrets. But we entered into a joint operating agreement with Penn. We took it to the IRS, and the IRS said, you know what, Annenberg School for Communication? And the articles in the Annenberg School for the Foundation said, our goal is to teach students, to charge tuition, to have teachers. And the IRS said, you're and what's the name of the educational organization, therefore not a private foundation. He donated the stock, got a full fair market value. Then when it was sold to Rupert Murdoch, there was no 2% investment in excise tax that's applied to private foundations. Uh, so what does that make me think of? That makes me think of Mark Zuckerberg. Mark Zuckerberg, a new model of philanthropy. The private foundations, the private foundation concept of him was, was so distasteful that he wouldn't set the foundation. There are so many restrictions on a private foundation as to the investments, as to the compensation, not that he wants to make it a dollar a year from Facebook, uh, as, as, as to, uh, again, the investments you can make, uh, as to a number of things that you can do under the Internal Revenue Code. And he says, there's no way I want to be a foundation. I want to make investments. I don't want to prove the IRS or not jeopardy investments. So he started the Chen Zuckerberg um, LLC, which we'll talk about briefly. And again, it's to avoid the private foundation rules, which is the same thing Will Randberg did to avoid the private foundation rules. It was so important to him. It was, it was, it was, it was brilliant. It was done before I was, I was uh, involved in his, his, his affairs. Uh, he also engaged in different types of gifts. And one of the points I'm making is that these days, from a new model of lengthy approach, you have to be very res receptive to taking gifts that you may not otherwise historically have taken. You can do it. I've had clients get very unusual gifts that produce Drexel, for instance, which and we'll talk about that, which 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 produce significant amount of cash, but it's not something you may want to you know, your first instinct would be I don't want it. Uh, but one of the things Amber did was he did unusual gifts. He gave fractional interest of artwork to the Met. Uh, there was a, a painting he bought Olo Panagio of Picasso that was on the cover of Time magazine, he bought for forty million dollars, which may not be that much these days. And he gave a fractional interest in the painting. And you can do that. Before the Pension Protection Act of 2006, and Senator Grassley didn't like the idea of someone having a painting by Picasso in his living room for 
for six months of the year, and the other six months of the year had to be in a museum. So that rule has been changed substantially. So if you keep a fractional interest within the next 10 years, you've got to keep the rest. Enberg never would have done it. But he saved over $100 million a year with this unusual fractional gift. And he was always saving ways to, you know, it was, it was uh, above board. It was, it was sanctioned by the IRS. And in one case, our painting that we gave for income tax purposes went to the Art Advisory Panel. They don't know if it's a state or, get, or income tax. So they don't know if it's going to be an increase in state tax or increase. They came back and said, you undervalued the painting by $30 million. So it had to have been a 1040 to take an extra power of production. It was just very weird. Uh, and another thing is, he had a yacht, probably uh, worth $600 million. Uh, he had double hip uh, surgery. His, his doctor said, you can't go on that yacht anymore. So, you know, as a philanthropic person he was, and he truly was, he decided he didn't want to sell it. He wanted to give it away. But remember, the related, I'm sure you're all familiar with this, and you should be if you're not, is that if you receive tangible personal property, the IR, the term, the uh, Congress would rather you give that tangible personal property to Newman University that's going to use it in its educational program. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, hand it over. Yeah, hand it over. As opposed to United Way, which is going to sell it. So, so if you use United Way, you can use that basis, which is a lot less typically the fair market value. But the Newman, that's going to teach students full, full fair market value. Um, so he had, he had a yacht. And believe it or not, a yacht is considered to be tangible personal property. He, he still, you know, even though it's public, he also he made a lot of money and figured he'd get the maximum uh, tax deduction. So it, it's, it's a tangible personal property. Uh, what did he do with it? He gave it to an organization that would use it to further to their extent purposes. Now, if you gave the new man, I don't know what the heck you would Guaranteed you'd find a way. You'd find a way. <laughs> <laughs> Any idea of where he gave it? Josh? What? He gave it to the uh, Naval Academy. And he had a full fair market value deduction. He, he was a little disappointed because the day after he donated it, they, they blew it out of the use it for uh, uh, military uh, practice. <laughs> and they exploded that baby. Oh, God. I was a joke. I think the commandant, I mean, it's a $6 million yacht. I mean, they're not going to blow it up. But I think the commandant had to use it and all that stuff. So I'm just saying, unusual gifts. You know, he did certain things that really are a trend for modern philanthropy. It wasn't usual, but now it is. Um, endowment grants, restricted grants, that's all it did. And today, I think the evidence will show that wealthy people, about 50 million or so, 76% or so of the time, they restrict their gifts. Nobody gets unrestricted gifts. Mrs. Enberg once got a call from Beverly Sills, the both deceased now, saying, you know, Lee, we have a plumbing problem at the Metropolitan Opera. We need $10 million. You know what he's going to, Josh Henley says, absolutely, just name it the Josh Henley plumbing system. I mean, it's not the, uh, nobody wants to do that, but Mrs. Sandberg didn't care. So basically it was a general grant for $10 million. Uh, and that doesn't, that doesn't come too often. So most gifts, which the Sandberg always did, were restricted. We even did art acquisition uh, and down a program for the Met. Here's money, you can use it to buy art. Because art museums can't afford to buy art uh, with their own money. Can't do it. It's expensive. Um, the Sunny Trust, uh, Annenberg, before he died, arranged for his 500 acre estate in Rancho Mirage to be placed in a charitable trust, which was an operating trust, not a grant making trust, but to operate for direct charitable purposes uh, on the death of Mrs. Annenberg and, and Leonard Annenberg. You know, people don't like necessarily plan upon you know, their demises, but he didn't mind. He, 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 he thought about these things. So today, the, the Amherst Foundation Trust of Sunnylands, if you Google sunnylands.org, you'll see it's an operating foundation, and I directed the trust document. The first part, part is that uh, if, you, if you use for, well, I hope I'm not using all my time for this, but uh, it's, it's, uh, it, if you use for, I don't think it's Trump at the time, but the President of the United States used it to Camp David West. Obama used it 10 times. Supreme Court has been there. So, private operating foundation. One of the big things today is hands on philanthropy. The Wall Street Journal did a report. The War Hall Next Door. Eli Broad was supposed to, at least in the Contemporary Museum of Art in L.A., thought all his paintings were going to go to them. He decided, I'm going to keep them. I'm going to create my own private operating foundation. They were disappointed, but the, the War Hall Next Door is people say, I have this art collection. I'm going to set up a, a limited uh, availability uh, you know, uh, museum. And it's going to be a private operating foundation. And when 
not going to give it away. But we're going to loan. So, and he also made a ton of foreign grants. And today, international philanthropy is a, is a trend. People are over six, seven billion dollars. Do you, would you do that? I'm not sure. If a donor, if a yeah. donor came to us yeah. and made, that's where they wanted to be. Yeah. Do yeah, then, then you would probably vet it to make sure it's a real charity. So he, we did a ton of, uh, of international uh, grant making. And as you know, international grant making is difficult because an individual in the Internal Revenue Code cannot take an income tax deduction for a grant to a foreign charity unless it has an IRS determination letter. And that's very rare. Um, so, so the IRS has streamlined that a bit uh, to make it easier. But individuals can't do it. So the only alternative is to do it through a private foundation or an international donor advice fund, or even for a, a non -inter an international U.S. donor advice fund, or for a community foundation. Um, so, so he led the way in that too. So just getting quickly into some of the topics, uh, after spending all my time on the <laughs> amount of topics, but that's okay, uh, is, is the LLC model. More and more uh, charities are using the limited liability company um, as, as an alternative um, to hold assets. Uh, to engage in certain operations where they want to protect the entity itself from liability or for, for, for some other purposes. So they set up a single member LLC, the tax purposes have disregarded. For years and years and years, the IRS would not say whether the donor made a uh, contribution to a single member LLC that was disregarded, whether they got a charitable income tax deduction. In 2012, uh, the IRS finally said, okay, you get an income tax deduction as long as the LLC is owned and controlled by the charity. So, so, so that's fine. So, so why use it? Again, protection of assets, since you're putting real estate in it, you may want to uh, put it into an LLC. Query, don't put it into an LLC until you're sure that you can get a real estate tax incentive for that. Because some municipalities say, where's your IRS determination right? We don't have one, we're an LLC, you know. So think, you always have to think. I had, I had these lawyers set up these dormitories for university, they did the LLC, and all of a sudden they went for exemption, they said, you can't get it. And then, but you can apply for exemption for an LLC these days. So that's what they did. They didn't need it, but they applied for exemption, just, just from the state, for the real estate tax exemption. Um, one other thing about the LLC is you can use you can use LLCs for donors. Let's say you have a donor that wants to do a certain project. You can say, and what's, you know, you have certain control donors, you know, they want to be involved. So you can say, what's up the LLC? I'm all appointed board of managers. And you can be the board of manager of all the people that you that you recommend. And it's a legal entity. They can operate it as long as the, as long as the charity you know, controls. And it's very popular these days, and that's actually the model that the Lentis Foundation used. Um, so that, so that, you know, why would you do that? You do that because there's usually a, a fee involved, because you're doing the administration, and you can make money doing that. So you can help your donor achieve his purposes, give him his control that he wants, he or she wants, because they're board of managers. They have a separate bank account, separate from the state legal entity. It's all in your 990, so you have to really oversee it, but it's more and more popular. Uh, it's similar to a fiscal sponsorship, uh, a type one, uh, a, a, a model A fiscal sponsorship um, using an LLC. And it's really popular with donors. If your donor wants to do a project and doesn't want to give you the money, say, well, why don't we, you want to help us. You want to keep control, let's do it this way. Um, so that's something to think about. In Pennsylvania has an active it used to be that LLCs could only operate for business purposes. Pennsylvania uh, amended their nonprofit LLC provision to, show, to say that they can be created as charitable organizations. Uh, it, was, it was pretty cool. So, you, so whenever I do an LLC for a 501c3, I make the LLC look exactly like a 501c3. The LLC is formed for 501c3 purposes, shall be organized and operated. No, no, no substantial part of this activity should be lobbying, no political activity, the whole bit, um, which, which helps us. Uh, Jerry Lanfest, he used an LLC, as, as was pointed out by Francis. Uh, you know, Jerry Lanfest owned PMN, Federal Community Network, which is the Inquirer Daily News, and he didn't really want to. There's no reason for him to own that. He, it wasn't an investment. But he viewed uh, the Philadelphia Inquirer and the papers as, as true community assets. Uh, I, I, I was doing this up. It was, I believe it was Thomas Jefferson who once said that if I had my choice, between government and newspapers, I would choose the latter. Now, Josh, you've written a very expensive uh, rebuttal of that, I believe. <laughs> right? That was, no, he didn't say that. So, well, that's true. Newspapers are important to democracy, and that's the only reason Jerry bought it. He didn't want it. So he said, Richard, what do I do with this thing? I don't want to leave it to my kids. 
I wanted a community hands. So I said, we were going to do a supporting organization, but I said, let's go to Pedro Ramos, who I was friendly with, and we set up an LLC. So the LLC owns the Philadelphia Media Network, which is still a tactical entity. It's kind of the reverse. PM, PM, PMN is, is not generating a whole bunch of cash. But think about what Milton Hershey did. Milton Hershey put in these really profitable corporations into the, the charitable trust, and it just generated, you know, 12, 13 billion dollar endowment. That's not going to happen with the Inquirer, but it's similar to that. The Portner Institute did the same thing, the same thing as we're climbing on those campus many times. Where for a while it was producing income, and now, now it's not. So the point of the Memphis Institute is to, is that we've got 25 board members, and we've got a great board, and it's, it's to look at ways in which uh, the printed newspaper can be converted to a digital. And we've been dealing with a lot of projects, we make a lot of grants, we have people studying this. Uh, so it's much more than just holding the newspaper. And one thing, I don't know if you folks know this, the Washington, the uh, Ford Foundation gave a half a million dollars to the Washington Post for political coverage. It seems kind of anti-intuitive. How can a how can a charity give the Washington Post, oh well, Jeff Bezos, no less, at the time he did. Uh, yeah, how can they do it? But you can, provided it's restricted for charitable purposes. The Bill and Linda Gates Foundation gave two million dollars to the Guardian. Um, for, you know, they gave the ABC, ABC News, ABC News for healthcare. At that time, uh, Diane Sawyer was making like $12 million a year. People were going nuts. Like, why are you doing that? You know? So, but it can be done. And so in our situation, the Memphis Institute for Journalism, can they grant the Philadelphia Media newspaper for certain type of coverage that furthers the mission of the Institute you know, to for their 501c3 purposes. The Winco Foundation gave three hundred fifty thousand dollars to PMN for a grant called Toxic City Grants, um, and that's perfectly permissible. So, so the idea behind that Jerry Lancaster was to combine philanthropy um, with a with a, you know for-profit business because we, we looked at converting the Inquirer to a 501c3, and there are a lot of newspapers that are 501c3s. There's a ton of them. San Francisco Public Press, Propolica, but the Inquirer, we said we could convert it, but it wouldn't be the Inquirer anymore. They, 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 they endorse candidates, you can't do that. Um, they, they sell tires, they do sport, we couldn't do it. So this is the next best thing. Uh, fiscal sponsorships, uh, I'll kind of wrap up quickly, but fiscal sponsorships has become really, um, you know, almost like donor by fund, but for activities. I got a call from someone from Hanford, they say, I want to set up a problem with C3, to take care of this park owned by the community. I said, you don't want to do that. Um, I said, why don't you contact the community foundation and do a fiscal sponsorship agreement? It's a contract. They'll, go, they'll house the charitable activity. And you don't have to file line nine. So they contacted them, and bam. Um, so fiscal sponsorship, there's different types of fiscal sponsorships, like A, like B, the LLC is now a new version. And they're becoming really popular. And I think of them as donor advised funds for activities. Because all the money is is separately accounted for. And you can engage tomorrow in a 501c3 activity even without applying for an IRS determination letter, and you'll never apply for an IRS determination letter. Uh, Zuckerberg, real quick, we spoke about a Boyd Surprise Foundation. Uh, Steve Jobs' widow has a similar thing in LLC. So basically, it's a guy who's saying, how many of these subs of the Pride Foundation rules? In 1969, they were enacted. They were so draconian. They, they, they weren't thought out well. There's just so many restrictions. You don't want to get your, you don't want to be subject to them. And he said, you know what? I'm going to set up a regular LLC, and I'm going to give away my money from my LLC. It's a pass-through. Uh, if he wants to give to a charity, he can get Facebook stock. And there's no gain recognition because the contribution of appreciated stock doesn't, rec doesn't trigger gain. And he makes a dollar a year from Facebook. He doesn't need a tax deduction. So it was beautiful. And it gives him all the power to do whatever the heck he wants Without Uncle Sam looking over his shoulder, and even the Attorney General. So it's pretty cool. And down which restricted, like I said, uh, people who have $50 million or more are interested in endowments and restricted gifts. So just be careful. One thing I would say is I, I, I was just hired as an expert witness for a Jewish day school in Las Vegas where they named the school after some man who gave $500,000. There was no grant grain agreement, there was nothing. And all of a sudden, this guy gave him $50 million. He said, I want the name. The school named after me, and they, and they did. And now they're, they're, they're being sued, and they're trying to get all the money back. The other guy gave them. And you got to just be so careful. you got to assume almost like you're going to be sued. And you're going to be sued. You're going to be questioned. 
So you want to basically uh, memorialize everything. So there's no question. They didn't do that. They had minutes. They had a grant agreement. And now it's, it's just, it's just a, 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 a total mess. Naming rights, uh, be careful with that. I always say that it's easy to uh, you know, pry off the facade of somebody's name, but you know, legally it's not. Um, so you've got to be careful. You don't want to insult your donor. And that's why it's good that the gift acceptance policy, to say naming rights. And you just say, if the donor walks in, well, that's our naming rights in our board of doctrine that we have to say if you can, if, if you, uh, you know, engage in some type of thing and they stole the reputation of the university, we, we, we were allowed to. Now when you go to the board, it's like, you know, it's, it's in existence. Um, or the lawyer, yeah. It, it, Dan, just blame it on Danny. I, I personally have zero problem with that. Uh, and, then, and then just a couple more points, uh, uh, you know, on, on, on these restrictions. Just be so careful what restrictions take. Uh, there's, there's an article about, I, I've written a lot of articles. I think they're allowed in the package, but that's okay. I've written an article about most of this stuff. If anybody wants articles I've written, I've probably written a, a hundred of them. But, there's a risk collection given the Death Museum of Art. They said, we'll give you this, we'll give you this, art, this, 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 this art collection, but you have to promise to build a villa. That's similar to the one that we have in Italy. And they built it, and then the critics said that the cost of the villa, oh, was more, it was worth more than the paintings. You know, so you really have to be careful, or if you agree to, you know, they give you 50 million, you agree also to 50, you gotta make sure you can do it. Uh, Vanderbilt University, I, work, I, I didn't work on that case, but I've heard about that case. 83 years ago, the United Emergency Confederacy, Confederacy gave a building for Memorial Confederate Hall to the George Peabody School, which merged into Vanderbilt. People got upset. You don't want that name. And, Vander, and they went to court. Vanderbilt lost. They said, well, you can give me $50,000 back. I think it's going to be plus the CPI adjustment. Finally, last year, Vanderbilt gave $1.3 million back to remove the name. So you really have to be careful. And sometimes we gave money to uh, the, the, uh, news me the museum in Washington, and, and I had just written about uh, Ron Perlman, namely stage. So I did to the editor, I said, no stage, no seats, nothing on the walls. And they were back, we were going to put the donors on their seats. But it wasn't my idea, I took the CEO, she goes, no, we don't, want, we don't want anybody's name. And they came back to the fine, so it cost a million dollars, but, and they said, well, in 25 years, we want to give you the right to uh, to give money, to keep your name on it, or if you don't, we want to be able to add a partner. And the Amber Foundation said, nah, we're not doing that. And they said, okay. Yeah. So they wanted the money. So, you know, you can't blame a charity, but think about, think about things like that. Think about what's going to happen in 25 years when you can't, you can't, uh, you know, the money to fix it up and the donor's not going to give you any more money and you're stuck. How are you going to, you know, it's like billions. Um, the Avery Fisher Hall, uh, it's not called David Fisher Hall. It's the Josh Henry Hall now? No, it's, it's the David Gethin Hall. And he gave the David Fisher Hall to give the, the uh, little family who was, the billions had, a, had an episode about it, and gave 15 million bucks back to give up their naming rights. Um, so it's just incredible. Be careful what you agree to, because if you come back to bite you, you're not, you know, it seems fine now, it seems fine five years from now, 10 years from now, but things happen. You, you, you really got to be careful. Uh, again, I put assets in a wrapper. You don't be scared to take, I had a client who put in $25 million of a limited partnership interest to a, to a local university. And I explained to them, you know, what's going on. It's got a lot of cash. But we could take control through a GP interest, but they took it. And they're swimming their money over it. So don't be scared to take assets that are unusual. Don't let them scare you off. Uh, and sometimes having real estate wrapped in a real estate partnership is better than taking the real estate itself. Um, private private operating foundations, like I said, Adam Burke had a son in his trust. Hands on philanthropy is becoming very popular. I had something for a charity that wanted to be an operating foundation. You know what? They have two employees. We entered to agree with the uh, University of Pennsylvania and Edward School. And they did all the work. And I submitted a ruling, because I read a ruling where they allowed this. I said, well, through uh, our relationship in a joint venture, most of the work is going to be done by Penn, but we retain all control over everything. And they say, you're an operating foundation, because at the time, we didn't want to pay out 5%. An operating foundation pays like 3 and a third percent, a lesser amount. We wanted to conserve the money. So, uh, so, 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 so that's pretty cool. And, and final thing, oh, 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 I pulled up uh, uh, Bank of America, um, 
charitable gift line, and it was amazing. All I wanted to do was set up a uh, donor box line for a Pratt Foundation. Every two seconds, the word out of her mouth is, well, if you want to transfer your funds to us, this is what you, I said, I said, you really want to sell us to transfer our funds. We don't want to transfer our funds. And it's just a short call. So, you know, there's a place, you know, there, there is a trend. Donors are collapsing the foundations and just saying, eh, we're just going to do a donor advice fund. Um, it makes more sense at this point. Uh, they'll be forced into doing it. Think about it uh, strongly. Uh, and also, limited life of the Pratt Foundation. Think about that. Because, you know, the, the older generation isn't always going to be around. But you could have a, a family foundation that's supporting you, and if, if they die, their kids may not. So, hey, talk to the people. It's almost like a will. Hey, do you mind? Imagine your articles or doing something to say that upon your passing that you'll still support us because you know even if the limit even if they decide to dissolve a lot of these charities preparations that dissolve are hesitant to give endowments to smaller charities they don't think they can handle it so in that case you can go to Crozier Community Foundation and set up a restricted fund and they handle it and every year the income goes to that's the way where you're avoiding. So that's why I say the power of community foundation is just going to be, you, you, you can do a lot with it, but when, when, you, when you're going to terminate a private foundation, just think about what you're going to do with the assets. And maybe you set up endowments, and if you don't think your charity can handle endowment, go to a community foundation. I would get a fidelity or something like that. Uh, go to a community foundation, if you want to support this, this, this local charity, here's, here's $300,000, you want to do uh, income, maybe a spending rule. You know, four to five percent every year. You give it to them, bam, and that's it. So think about the older clients you've been depending upon for years. It's like a will. Can you, can you put us in your will in your foundation so that you know? I know you, you you really support us, and if something happens to you, God forbid, we could really be in trouble because we rely upon your your, your resources. So I could go on and on and on, but nah, I think I think that's enough. <laughs> Appreciate that very much. Um, as I, as you heard, um, there's a wealth of information there, as we've had from all of the speakers, and uh, you'll be able to tap into that. Quick reminder to everybody: you've got cards on your table. Please, please, please ask the questions. I'll be around to collect those in a few minutes as um, Josh is speaking. I'll be walking around, Josh. Sorry to do that, but um, but it'll give you guys the opportunity if you have a specific question about some of the things that we talked about. Um, on a housekeeping note, we've asked for them to turn the uh, to turn the uh, air down and the heat off. So just so everybody knows, because we're all getting pretty chilly. Uh, so the the next speaker, um, we've been uh, lucky enough to have drive up from Virginia to speak for us today. Also a member of Buchanan Ingersoll, Joshua Headley. Josh is an associate in the D.C. office, specializing in tax wealth and succession planning and nonprofit organizations. He regularly works with fiduciaries on the states and trust administration matters. And again, remember for each of you in the room, when you're thinking about your questions, think about how um, the items that both Josh and Richard have talked to you um, specifically about how, what kind of donors you have. Um, how can you think about changing those rules or, or how would that best apply for you? So, um, without further ado, Mr. Josh Headley, please. Good morning, everyone. Uh, interesting, I, I just uh, was reminded listening to Richard speak, uh, my law school was recently renamed to Scalia Law School after a large donation. So, goes to show it is a is a new topic, and I'm going to be more focused today in what I'm speaking on. Uh, we're going to discuss crowdfunding. Um, so just to start with a basic definition, uh, essentially crowdfunding is raising money from a large group of people. Uh, the modern sense of when we see this is typically online, uh, but crowdfunding has actually been around for a long time. Um, can you hear me? There we go. Sure thing. So actually in the... Uh, an early example of crowdfunding was that the Statue of Liberty in the late 1800s ran out of money and a local New York newspaper um, put, out, put out a call for funds and 
sure enough, from all across the country, uh, about $100,000 was raised enough to complete the statue. So it's been around for a while. It's becoming more and more popular now through use of online platforms is where we see it. And I'll talk a little bit more about these online platforms, but there's a, a whole variety of them and a whole variety of ways that, that funds can be raised. Uh, and really what you see with crowdfunding and how nonprofits often use them is uh, a traditional model of philanthropy would be, or for an organization is, you have a select group of donors, uh, maybe it's a family, maybe it's a certain folks in the community, and they've got a plan for how they want to raise money. And this nonprofit is going to have a long-running legacy or plan for how they carry that out. With crowdfunding now, you have more targeted projects or a certain issue um, that's going to be used, that's going to highlight what the organization does. Maybe we're just fixing that issue, or maybe it's just raising awareness about what the nonprofit does, and then funds will be used to support both that specific issue and then the goals of the more general goals of the organization itself. And it's really something to take notice of. For, I'm sure many folks here uh, that, are in it, that, that are in the industry are already aware of it, um, but it's projected that crowdfunding will become a $96 billion industry by 2025. Uh, it's really um, relative to traditional uh, fundraising. It's, it's seen as more affordable. It's uh, relatively efficient. Um, it's a marketing tool. Um, if you had 10, 10 people and they gave about $1,000 to an organization, or if you had 100 people who gave $10 to the organization, it really, you've, you've got a much larger number of people who know about your organization and what they do. So even though you're getting the same amount of money, you've really put your name out there. And a lot of the goal, one of the big goals with crowdfunding is you want to start a viral campaign. Uh, everyone knows uh, the, uh, uh, the, the recent ALS fundraising, the Ice Bucket Challenge started, and that was one where a, a ton of money was raised and really got this whole thing started. So that's just a brief primer on what it is, and I'm a little short on time here, so please, I hope during the Q&A session, if anyone has questions about it, let me know. But I wanted to flag a few legal considerations um, for folks who do use crowdfunding. Um, every state is gonna have its own uh, charitable solicitation registration requirements, and essentially what this means is there's gonna be a state statute that says, if an organization or a person is gonna raise funds in the state, then they have to register. Um, it's going to be a filing where you're going to give uh, financial information about the organization, uh, information on how it obtained ex its exemption, and um, typically that's going to be filed with the attorney general or with another state agency. So if a, a charity or another nonprofit has a website or they launch a campaign online uh, where it's more passive, they're not really going into Virginia, they're not going into the state of Pennsylvania and asking folks who live there for money. Um, but they just have a website people can go to, are they really fundraising in that state? And it's, it's not clear. Uh, all the state laws are different. You, you really have to take a tailored approach. And if your campaign is focused in one state or one community, then you can be pretty sure you're going to need to register there. But if it starts small, or if you have a more national scope in what the organization is doing, then you're going to need to have someone look at these issues in each state and make sure that you're in compliance. And also the, the crowdfunding platform itself uh, they possibly could be considered a professional solicitor. And if you're a professional solicitor, there's also registration requirements in each state. So an organization that has already started crowdfunding or is looking into starting it, uh, just be aware that there is going to be, there could be state compliance requirements that you're going to need to stay on top of. Uh, another issue is uh, for uh, restricted donations. Um, like I said before, a lot of times crowdfunding, there's a specific cause. Uh, that is being used to raise money for. Need to, uh, an organization needs to carefully word um, how it's asking for money. If you really are saying you're going to solve one specific project, if it's one, one family you're trying to help or one building you're trying to construct, what if you raise a lot more money than is needed to build it? If you say in your solicitation it's going to be used just for that, then you could be in a bind. It's a great, it's a great problem to receive more money than you're looking to get, but you just need to be, be sure that you're flexible in your language and if you want the funds to be used for your more general charitable purposes, you need to say that explicitly. Just think about how you word it when you're crowdfunding online. Uh, another legal concern would be acknowledgments. Um, a normal long-running rule, if, uh, if someone donates money to an organization, uh, typically you're going to give them acknowledgement of that. It's going to confirm the name of your organization, the date of their gift, how much the gift was. And uh, particularly important for crowdfunding is um, you would also acknowledge if, they, if that donor receives something tangible, 
in exchange for their earth, part of their donation, they need to report that to them because it's really going to only be the value above what they receive in return. So with online crowdfunding, oftentimes to get folks motivated to keep giving, you'll set these targets where if we raise this much, you'll get this gift, or we, we hit this target, and you'll get this. So if people are going to receive gifts back, then you need to be sure that, one, you're complying with those donor acknowledgments, and you're making sure that you track whatever gifts or awards you may be uh, giving back as part of that process. And it, uh, there can be pretty significant, significant implications with uh, failing to comply with that. Checking my time here. Okay. Um, another legal issue that, that comes into play with uh, crowdfunding is uh, private benefit and private inheritance rules. And for any nonprofit, um, very serious implications can happen if, if an organization is set up for its charitable purpose, but it ends up benefiting persons that aren't in line with that charitable person. So usually this would be insiders in the organization. You have to be very careful that those insiders aren't receiving some sort of tangible financial benefit as part of the organization's activities. So with, with crowdfunding, and this is again thinking about what the cause is you're raising money for, and it's going to depend on each type of organization, you need to be sure that how, the, how are those funds going to be used? And these are, these are things you want to think about on the front end, the decision-making process, the planning process, before you launch that, that campaign, make sure that there's not going to be any issue where someone inside the organization could be receiving a financial benefit from that. And uh, it really could be serious implications that tax stamp status could be lost. So it's just very important to be aware of that. Uh, one more legal requirement that I, I wanted to flag uh, that has to deal with crowdfunding is the UBIT, or Unrelated Business Income Tax. So this again goes into play if, if your organization is using a, a crowdfunding platform and they're, they're going to be uh, giving some sort of uh, award or someone receives a prize if they get a certain amount of money or if a goal is hit. If you're giving donors uh, that amount something back, uh, just, just be aware that once you get into the territory, if the IRS was to consider the organization um, carrying on a business where there's really a transaction happening, someone's receiving some sort of financial benefit, it's not just making the donation, there can actually be a, a tax filing or a tax implication with that. Um, so that's something where when, generally I would say it's better to have more of a de minimis, a smaller gift or something that is just more, it's more meaningful and a, less of a financial sense and just more achieving the organization's goal. Um, because once it really is, once the more it looks like a financial transaction is occurring and someone's really receiving something in exchange for that gift, you might get into the territory where you'd have to be filing for unrelated business income taxes. Uh, so those are the legal requirements. And just to quickly go through a few, a few practical tips outside the legal, the legal space, um, just make sure that uh, if you were to start a, a crowdfunding campaign, what, think about what your goal is and what story do you want to tell. What is, that, um, what is that issue that you want to solve? Uh, maybe it's, I think for some organizations it can be tough to do that. Maybe there isn't a specific problem or a specific thing that's very flashy. But if you really just think about what your story is and how you can kind of take it to the micro level um, and what your financial goal is for a project, it can, it can really be helpful and I think uh, achieve success in just finding out what your story is and then telling that story. Um, one other practical consideration um, when using a crowdfunding platform is people want to give to a winner. Um, they want to see. They want to give to an organization where they see the funds are going up. So what what I would recommend is, if an organization is just getting into that space, look at the folks who already give money and support you, and let them know that it's coming. Give them a heads up. Have about thirty percent of your donations in the bag before you get started. So that way, when you launch, you're much more likely to be successful. And when people are sharing on Facebook that they gave or sharing on other sorts of public media that they gave, they're going to see that it's a winner, it's already received money, and they're, they're going to be more likely to give to it. That's one practical consideration. And then um, other than that, just think about uh, just who are, who are the public media, who are the, the influence, influencers in social media, and are there people like that that you could get on board ahead of time that they can, they can retweet what your, what your campaign is or they, they can share, share it on their Facebook page. All those things on the front end, really for all these issues, just thinking about them on the front end and having a plan and create a place can really uh, just help to have a, a successful online crowdfunding campaign for your organization. And with that, thank you, and please let me know if you have any questions.
One of the things I do want to say to you, though, if you have, if there's questions that you have and they haven't been answered, uh, please feel free to ask further questions. Raise your hand. This is really the interactive time period for folks to get answers to questions that they may not otherwise be able to have answered. So at this time, I'd like to turn it over to a great partner, Alex Steyer, Bellevue Communications. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, and uh, I guess my first thing, uh, just before we get into the Q&A portion of it, is um, who am I and why exactly am I here? And um, so uh, <laughs> I work for Bellevue Communications Group. Uh, we help with a lot of the marketing communications and uh, some curriculum planning for uh, the Newman Center for Leadership. And uh, this particular program um, was sort of uh, partially conceived by myself and um, oddly enough as I was sitting here uh, getting ready for the program I got one of those uh, Facebook uh, memories and uh, five years ago today I got my job offer at Bellevue Communications Group so I left the nonprofit field literally five years ago today um, so uh, I kind of rekindled a lot of the stuff and uh, so like I said uh, previously to working at Bellevue uh, I spent about four years working for a nonprofit the Philadelphia Art Alliance um, which is located in Philadelphia uh, arts institution um, I chased Knight Foundation grants um, I chased a lot of different grants at that time um, and so uh, it's always been particularly uh, relevant to me and I always loved attending these types of programs when I was working in a nonprofit because um, I just feel like it's so important to hear directly from the people who are in charge of making those grants and in charge of you know making those types of decisions because it's always going to inform your process and it's always going to make your process better. Uh, so first things first, I uh, want to take a quick temperature of the audience here. Um, so with regards to nonprofit grant making, uh, how many folks here have either written a grant themselves, uh, overseen a grant proposal? Uh, show of hands, can we see up there? Fantastic. So we have, for the most part, uh, you guys are relatively experienced. Um, but for those in the back and for those who aren't, uh, I want to just take a quick, uh, you know, throw out to Patrick and, and, and Francis a little bit. Um, what would be kind of your guys' first tip for a, uh, you know, person who's going to be applying for a grant? Um, what would you tell them for a first timer? Visit the foundation. Oh, and you know what? Uh, yeah. you put that <laughs> microphone on first. To actually, it should it's be. on the box. It should be an on switch. Okay. There we go. All right. Um, I think the very first thing is visit the foundation's website. I mean, that's just so basic, but you would be shocked how many people don't do that. And then I think pick up the phone and call. I mean, most of us try to be as accessible as possible, return calls, have a conversation. In fact, we, we've been talking about what our new RFP process will look like next year. And I think if we can manage the staffing piece, uh, I think we're going to make it a requirement that if you're going to apply for a grant, you have to call first because we'd hate to see you waste your time if your proposal just isn't going to fit within the grant gu guidelines. Yeah, I, mean, I would I'd echo that in terms of you know research the the foundation in, in kind of multiple levels of research in so far as. You know, is it is it is it open call? Are they doing challenge grants like we do? Is is it a combination of both? And even if you can look into, you know, are they calendar fiscal year? You know, when when is their fiscal year start? When is their fiscal year end? Um, because I think you know, in terms of you know dollars that are moving out the door from a private foundation perspective, uh, you know, we are mandated by the IRS to to move you know, X amount of dollars based on the endowment out the door in Y amount of time. Um, so I think, you know, it, the most, the best you could do in, in so far as finding information about the foundation, I think, you know, the, the better you are uh, in terms of making, uh, uh, you know, making a, a good grant. And, and the grants that I've seen that have been the best have really, uh, you know, tied into, you know, not just our interest areas, but then also are are investing in, you know, in in momentum versus a uh, versus a moment. I mean, one of the things I I didn't say in my opening is, you know, Knight really looks at ourselves as social investors. You know, the the return we want on our investment is is change, is, is positive, is positive social change. Um, and I think the the last piece of advice I'll give is is probably the most pragmatic is. Is be realistic in the in the activities and, and the outcomes. Um, I mean, I, I've seen many many a grant that you're, you're just taking on way too much in a 12 month, an 18 month, or a 24 month window. 
So, so be realistic with, with, what, you, with what you think you, you can accomplish in, in the activities and also in, in the outcomes too. And I think that, that can come about you know, through a conversation with you know, someone who's on the ground, whether they be a, you know, a program director or a program officer. Um, but you know, really try to, you know, as, as best you can, be, be concise in, in the activities and, and the outcomes when you're, when you're doing any, any grant write-up. Um. So let's dig in a little bit on that too, Patrick, um, especially while I still have you. Um, Patrick is going to have to jump uh, a little bit early from our panel discussion. Um, what kinds of new you know, ways are you quantifying outcomes nowadays? I mean, obviously you said social change. How do you quantify that? Yeah, I mean, uh, it's, a, it's a really good question. Um, and you know, we, we benefit from Knight of, of having a great team that is, that is based in Miami, uh, learning and impact. and. So you know we work in we work in partnership with them on the foundation side, but then we we also work with with our partners on the ground in in various cities. Um, I mean, a lot of what I was presenting on on the Civic Commons work is is driven by by data that that we've sponsored in in the foundation and and really trying to look in and and drill deep in the role of civic assets in terms of you know building sustained civic participation sustained civic engagement um, you know trust efficacy with within a community uh, and I think you know we, we have a pretty good body of research that that is trending towards the the impact that you know places like libraries and and parks and, and rec centers have uh, on, on those levers, and I think intuitively it would make sense to most people who, who are familiar with these kind of civic assets, um, but it, do, it doesn't hurt to have like a body of research around that. Uh, more specifically, you know, we've done a lot of research on, on voting, um, so you know, when we kind of talk about sustained civic engagement, one of the metrics that we are looking at is, is, is local voting. Um, you know, it's, and the trends there are not always always so good uh, <laughs> in terms of participation um, we're also uh, really looking at uh, you know the from a community perspective uh, you know the diversity of, of leaders uh, you know are the leaders on the ground representative of, of the community uh, or are they not uh, and if they're not why not um, so that's one of the things that, that we're looking at as well in terms of the in, in terms of some of that hard data. I mean that's a that's a whole other conversation mm -hmm. uh, that we can get into. So I don't want to monopolize sure. all of all the time on the uh, panel. I'd like to turn that over to you, Francis. Well, too. Um, I think what Patrick is touching on is how important it is for you to know your field, right? So if you're if you're an arts organization and you're involved in the Delaware County Arts Alliance and you attend events at the Greater Philadelphia Arts Ali Arts and Cultural Alliance you're going to be part of conversations about evaluation, right? You're going to become more familiar with, oh, you know, is it about how many people show up for your shows or is it about doing some sort of surveying of your um, people who come to your shows to see how much they liked your shows? Is it about, you know, the diversity of the people who come to your shows? You know, y you want to be as much as possible informed about how your peers and what funders are looking for from your peers um, really means success. So that's that's just a, I think you know critically critically important. Yeah, I, I get a sense that uh, more and more funders are looking for measurables. So they they, they want to set forth measurables up front to to determine uh, you know whether the outcome met what was. You know what was intended as as, as a measurable uh, to whether, whether it was with a newspaper where they run a story on toxic city whether whether the measurable should be increased subscribers, increased clicks, or or just uh, you know uh, public awareness of, of the issue. But I think that more and more with social entrepreneurship, you know they want to make sure that you know what they want achieved is going to be achieved. Uh, and they need they need proof of that, and you know, and without that, I think there's you know less inclination to continue making grants. I mean, it's so important to that that you meet these measurables up up, up front, uh, at least establish the measurables up front, and then can meet them over the long run. Do you find? I, I know that's how it is with Lenfest. They're they're you know we're, we're dealing. We're dealing with so many people, and measurables is such a such a big concept these days. And it's different in different fields. I mean, what you measure in culture is very different from what you would measure in a health organization. 
It actually gets to something, Richard, you said in your comments uh, about the organization that wanted to set up a new 501c3. And you dissuaded them from that idea. And, you know, I hate to dissuade people. I mean, if you, want, if you have an idea and you want to follow your heart, it's a free country, go for it. But one of the challenges, I think, for funders is when a nonprofit calls and they have this, a new person calls and they have this brilliant idea and you're saying, well, gee, are you aware of this other organization in the community that's also addressing that issue? Oh, I didn't know that. But my idea is different. This is the different thing I'm going to be doing. And so getting back to the original question, I think it's really really, really important for you to know who are the other uh, players in the field that you are planning to play in. Because there may be somebody out there who's doing exactly the same thing. Maybe not, but you better be informed about them because otherwise the message you're sending to me is you don't really know what's going on out there. And we can't afford every, every there's an opportunity cost for every dollar that we invest in a nonprofit is a dollar we can't give to another nonprofit. And so we have to really think very carefully about which are the nonprofits that are really worth investing in. Not because you're not a wonderful and worthwhile person, but because you may not, by the time we invest in something brand new and you start to get traction, I could have invested in helping you know, 10, 20,000 pe 20, people around another issue that I said no to because you somehow sold me on the idea that this great new idea was really going to make a difference, but then it turns out you didn't even know that there was another organization down the road doing almost the exact well, same thing. I, I find a lot of times, like, like I once received a call from uh, a general counsel of an organization with Haiti Relief and said, we want to set up a 501c3 organization to for fill up the Haiti Relief Fund to receive contributions that we'll distribute to organizations in the U.S. so we'll you know, distribute the money to foreign. I said, you don't want to do that. So the next day, I had him with the president of our local community foundation. Bam! The Philip Haiti Relief Fund. It was in the newspaper, and, and we just got, we didn't rely upon the community foundation for funding. We relied upon the readers, and we got tons of money, uh, and it was all, you know, went through the community foundation. Where, where does Crozier, Chest, Crozier Community Foundation, when you say you, 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 you make investments, where's that money coming from? Well, right now, the funding that we, the programs that we have now, the Healthy Star program with Nurse Family Partnership, those receive federal and state uh, funding. So we've already got programs that we're running with public dollars. And then we also have some restricted funds. For instance, the Girls' Night Out event that some of you may have attended, this crazy event with over 600 women uh, once a year that raises money to help women with cancer, we house those dollars. So we move that money out the door almost on a daily basis to help women with cancer who are facing financial challenges. We also have some restricted funds for people who are on hospice or home care. But the actual dollars that we will be using to make larger grants next year to nonprofits, that comes from the sale of the health system, which actually Buchanan Ingersoll was the law firm, uh, one of Richard's partners, just a coincidence. Um, they manage the transaction, and you probably have read in the paper that we just want a major hurdle in that effort and those are the large you know that's the ballast of funds that we've inherited that we'll be using to move out the door to um, to benefit nonprofits in the community so I think we have a question in the back actually real quick uh, Specifically, yeah, I mean, I can, I can only answer it. Repeat the question. So she basically said that uh, 
the city team is in generally speaking is in need of a lot of general operating money um, you know not necessarily project specific uh, grant funds how would they go about you know approaching a, a foundation for that kind of thing hey, I, I guess I, I can only answer from the from the Philadelphia context and maybe there's there's lessons learned that, that can be applied here um, but in I think it was 2015 you know William Penn Foundation in partnership with the Philadelphia Foundation uh, Knight was also a partner. I wasn't. I wasn't with Knight at the time. Uh, you know, pooled pooled philanthropic dollars to create a, a fund. I think that lives at the Philadelphia Foundation. You know, where where nonprofits can, you know, apply for for operating dollars. Right. Um, there are other foundations in in the Philadelphia landscape um, that will specifically do you know operating dollars. Um, Knight. Knight Foundations, uh, you know, from from our perspective, and, and some foundations, you know, we, we don't we don't do indirect cost. We have a pretty pretty firm rule about that, and that's kind of across the private foundation landscape. That's that's pretty standard. You might have to get like a permission to to have indirect cost, um, but but we do understand that um, that programs need to be run by people. Um, so we, um, you know, we we. Uh, you know, it, it's a case by case basis, but typically, um, you know, we we would we do support a number of my active grants. Obviously, have um, you know staff dollars and, and operations built into that. Um, I mean, again, I think it I think it goes back to to the research. I think it goes back to to knowing the the philanthropic in, environment, um, and and I think it goes back to um, um, you know. Trying to trying to, to make the match. I mean, you're right. They're they're few and far between. You know, on the operating side, uh, I've only been in foundation work as a grant maker for two years. So, I, in most of my career is government and nonprofit. So, I, I have experienced the frustration firsthand. Um, <laughs> So, I mean, that's my imperfect answer to yeah. it. Yeah. I mean, there, are, there are foundations that, that allocate to, 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 to payroll costs and, and certain you know, direct expenses incurred by employees. Hey, what's your take? I was just curious. Uh, a few years ago, you know, it's, it's just so fascinating that uh, the city of Philadelphia came together and I think, I think raised in a period of three weeks. I know Mrs. Annenberg, I, 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 I did a grant agreement with $15 million going through Pew that went to um, went through to, to Jefferson, where where the city of Philadelphia raised sixty to seventy million dollars for the Gross Clinic, and, oh, yeah. and you know a lot of people got upset by that. So we kept the painting. It's in the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Uh, the Institute. Or, or the, yeah, or it's the back and forth. Or, yeah, it's 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 half owned by the. Uh, Pennsylvania Academy. Pennsylvania Academy of, of Fine Arts. So people, a lot of people got upset by that. Why are we spend? Why are we? Why are we going after? They went after that painting big time. It was like seventy million dollar so painting. Though. It was just so special. I don't know. It it is especially when it's at the art museum across from the, um, is it the algae? The the other painting that he yeah. did. I mean, it attracts tourism dollars. I. I don't know. I don't think you can quantify arts and culture. There was a big, there was a big backlash about that. Yeah. Like, why are we spending seventy million dollars? Why are people putting seventy million dollars? And, and we've always homeless people. It's their money, sure, but uh, just this raises raises some 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 issues. Is that is that is that the best use of film? Probably. She has a rebuttal back there. <laughs> so special. Mm -hmm. And yeah, yeah, private donors who wanted to do it. I mean, it was the. Uh, I mean, we we go into many things. The art of the steel. You know, uh, we, we, we don't want to go. Yeah, we don't we'll, go we'll, we'll, we'll stop it. But I was involved in that because my clients uh, gave a lot of money. So, so can I just? I was yeah, going to add one say, thing for Nancy. You know, foundations are not where all the money is. And so, yes, family foundations that particularly care about funding basic needs or have a have a, a religious. Uh, bent are perfect for you, but you probably, rather than spending so much time on grant making, uh, grant writing, other than for those few 
foundations, maybe most of your time needs to be spent on a major donor cultivation yeah, project. Maybe. You know, going after individual donors. You have such a great case. I mean, I always hear about City Team um, going to spur, you know, religious institutions, churches, synagogues in Delaware County and throughout the area. So. Yeah. 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 I, You're welcome. I, I was going to say, Josh, do you have anything to kind of add on that, like the individual side? I mean, or, or you know, ideas to kind of spark individual fundraising for, for an organization like City Team? Uh, they do a ton of, you know, direct work with schools, with children, you know, in the community. You see the guys with the jackets on. I mean, you know, that's a... Yeah, the red jackets. Right. I guess I would just say... Um, City Team. Wrong one. Perhaps one way to raise awareness, even if, I think, like I, I said before, kind of maybe finding one success story, one individual thing that was successful and trying to build on that rather than talking about this the whole universe of, of problems that need to be fixed maybe one person um, people like to hear a story about mm. someone overcoming a challenge and be a part of that so maybe to the extent you can you know focus on that I think and, and <coughs> form a story around that it could be helpful in raising funds yeah it's interesting because now Temple has their first Rhodes Scholar who came from Community College of Philadelphia I don't know if anybody knows that yeah. But he started at a community college of Philadelphia, and then transferred to Temple, and he's a Rhodes Scholar. Uh, I'm not sure. To, I mean, that's not their sweet spot, producing Rhodes Scholars yeah. at Community College of Philadelphia. But it's a, it's a great story. Yeah. Uh, so uh, this one's probably going to be mostly geared towards Richard. Uh, based on what you hear from your clients, what is an effective way of getting the message out to potential donors about unconventional giving methods, i.e., the LLCs? How do you sell that to an individual? To an individual who you know maybe you're cultivating as a nonprofit, um, that you know maybe there's some other avenues that they can give. Yeah, well, well, I mean, typically foundations uh, make grants. They they don't typically engage in direct travel activities. Um, you know, in, in part because they don't want to expose their endowments to, you know, liability from direct charitable activities. So, you know, many times they put in LLCs. But, you know, a, a charity that can sell, like, like, like the, I needed the Philadelphia Foundation because I could not have the Lenfest Institute for Journalism be a private foundation. Because remember, with a private foundation, you have to distribute out 5% of the fair market value of your assets. And one of the things they own was the Philadelphia Inquirer. That was, you have to divide, you have to take 5% of that. It's a, it's a boatload of money. You don't necessarily want to do that. Uh, there's 2% excise tax, you know, and that's what I want to pay that. So, so, you know, it's becoming more and more popular for charities to be able to offer their donors, say, look, you know, we can, we can, we can offer you a, a separate legal and distinct entity where you can, you can do activities that further, that further our causes, but you can take control of it by being on our board of managers. Now, of course, you, you control the board of managers because you appoint the board of managers, but it's, a, it's, it's becoming more and more popular. It's almost like, just like fiscal sponsorships are becoming more, more spons, are, are becoming more popular. It's, uh, it's a way where people can engage in, in 501c3 activities without a 501c3. So I had someone call me from Haverford. I want I wanted to set up an organization to be a 501c3 to take care of a park. I said, I, I, I wouldn't recommend that. You've got to do so much. There's a lot of work to do. You went to 1023EZ. I said, contact your, do you do, do you do fiscal sponsorships at this point? You can, absolutely. So well, I said, contact your community foundation, see if we'll do a fiscal sponsorship. And they said, we'd be happy to. Um, so everything was done through a type A comprehensive uh, fiscal sponsorship agreement where they, or, or maybe it was through a type C, I, I don't remember which one, where you know, they can collect charitable contributions that went through the uh, organization. And, and it's, it's really something where we can offer donors ways to raise money. So what do we get out of that? Well, most fiscal sponsorships, you know, take a fee. And there's nothing wrong with that. Some of them charge 10%. And if that can add to your coffers, you're doing something good. You incur expenses. You know, you, 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 sh you know, it's, I don't think there's anything wrong with taking money to, to further a charitable purpose. I mean... It costs money to, to do these things. And follow up from Danny. Question, um, Richard, because um, you call it the, it's such a learning panel. So can you do what I would call the um, cliff notes version? I guess not supposed to do that. But it's showing my age. But for those <laughs> here, to understand what you're talking about, this is sponsorship. I'm not sure specifically what that means, yeah. or you could sort of talk to them. <laughs> 
Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. 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 Right. And I. I and a physical sponsorship isn't, isn't necessarily the right vehicle for an organization that's already a 501c3, but physical sponsorships are used for certain projects, like this, 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 uh, this park project. Uh, but I've used fiscal sponsorships all the time for organizations that want to engage in projects that further exempt purposes, but they don't want to go through the trouble of going through a 1023, the Articles of Corporation, the Bylaws, Conflict of Interest. Uh, you know, there's a million things you have to do, and you know we do that all the time. So, so what you do is it's 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 as simple as a donor advised fund. There are fiscal sponsorship agreements that set forth that the fiscal sponsor, i.e., the public charity, has. It almost like the variance power of a donor advised fund where they have full control over the, the use of the funds, but they agree that the use of the funds shall be to achieve this certain purpose. And they respect that purpose. So if you want to do something, whether it's take care of a park or want to engage in activity, you can offer your donor, and I've, I've done this before where, I've, you know, where I said to the donor, you don't want to file 1C3, it's just, <coughs> this is not worth it. Uh, Urban Affairs Coalition in Philadelphia is one that has, they say, we are home to nonprofit projects. Mm -hmm. They have a boatload of them, mm -hmm. and they have, a, so you can go on their website, Urban Affairs Coalition, and they have sample fiscal sponsorship agreement for type A, which is comprehensive, where everything is on the, the uh, books of the uh, fiscal sponsor. And then where they do a pre-approval uh, process where they pre-approve distributions to your organization and, and you do your own tax return. Uh, there's, there's different, and then of course there's the LLC, which isn't used as much, but they sponsor your organization. So all of a sudden, you know, it's, it's their taking on responsibility for the activity. It's on their 990, you don't file 990, but you can do your project and you pay a fee, but Think about it. If you were going to do a 501c3, you're going to pay a fee to the IRS, to Pennsylvania. You, you, there's, there's just a boatload of, of, of costs incurred. And with a simple fiscal sponsorship agreement, you can, you can bam, you can, you can represent to your donors, hey, write checks to the Urban Affairs Coalition not, or, or the uh, Crozier Community Foundation. Uh, we have fiscal sponsorship agreement with them, and uh, right? And, and it can increase the trust the donors have that their dollars are being managed yeah. Well, and you all, you all may have read the article in the paper the other day about the guy, the businessman in Margate who did a fundraiser for Puerto Rico and raised like $15,000 while all the money's gone and like $1,500 went to Puerto Rico. And now everybody in Margate is all up in arms. Where did yeah. the money go? And, but, you know, you kind of saw that coming, uh, unfortunately. Yeah. And that's one of the values of, of if yeah. you don't already have a 501c3 and you want to make sure that your donors or your sponsors can feel confident that the dollars are going to be used the way you're saying they're going to be used. Yeah. Um, you house them elsewhere, which is different from the programs we run. We are not the fiscal sponsors of Healthy Start and WIC. They are our programs. The, whoa, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, but a fiscal sponsorship, it's still your program. We're just your back office, essentially. They're your, they're your house, but they also maintain uh, uh, compliance with IRS requirements, state attorney general requirements, tax returns, and there's nothing to prevent you uh, from going on your own. In the meantime, applying for 501c3 exemption. So you get your feet wet. See how it goes. See how successful it is. There's nothing to say. Fiscal sponsorship isn't a perpetuity. You say, you know what? We're ready for our own board. We're ready to, to be on our own. And we're going to branch off and be our own entity. But the fiscal sponsorship is a good testing ground. And it's just becoming so popular. It's, it's, I, I view it as a, a similar to a donor advice fund, but instead of a charitable giving account, it's a project account because say sub account all your money. All your money from your donors goes in a sub account. So anytime you want, you know how much money is available to you to spend for your account. So more and more, uh, you know, charities are looking at ways to help donors. The LLC is a cool way to do it, where it's a real major project like Landfest, uh, where I mean Jerry put forty million dollars in, he's a forty four million dollar matching grant. There's a lot going in there. So he, he didn't want a fiscal sponsorship. He wanted a separate and distinct legal entity. And the Philadelphia Foundation was, you know, this is a good relationship with us. was willing to work with that. 
But the fiscal sponsorship is, is something uh, to be considered. And I, I, like I said, when I have a client go to me, I consider donor advice fund. I, I really consider whether it's worth it uh, to get involved with the 501c3 um, or, or whether or not just to bam. Because they, they had Philadelphia Haiti relief done in two seconds. The next day, there's a big article. Contributions may be made to the Philadelphia Foundation. And they got a boatload of money. And it went to it went to charity. It was not. It was not. And and then and then you are not subject to any any criticism like the person from Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. but what happened to the money? Well, you know. It's so so, awful. what's that? It's awful. It so yeah. discourages future giving. And yeah. So there's a lot of different ways charities, you charities, can you know can can engage donors to who have interest in your programs to say you know what you can you can engage in your own program. You can have some control of this. Um, and we'll run it for you, but, but you'll, you'll take the reins. But there's a cost, and you know, many times it's 10% of the gross receipts, and it's not outlandish. You, you, need, you need that, uh, that funding, and sometimes they don't mind because, you know, there's support, and you can use that for your, you know, general, you know, there's very few people, Beverly Sills, who's deceased, can call for $10 million general support obligation, just like, um, uh, what, what's it called? Team? Um, I'm sorry. I see them all City over. Team? City, City team, team with the red jackets. I see them all over. It's hard to it's hard to attract general operating support because this it's, it's not something people you know people want their names. So there's not that many Leonor Annenbergs who will say, "Here's 10 million. Fix your plumbing." There's Josh Headley, of course, who will do that uh, because he he's you know he's a philanthropic guy. And uh, <laughs> uh, true, Patrick, do you get him? Very true. Very true. All right, so I got one more then. Uh, one more for Patrick before he does leave. Um, so this one comes from the audience. Uh, a trend I've been seeing among foundations and corporations is rather than to issue an RFP, they will pre-select the organization they want to fund and close the RFP process. The question is, do any panelists, and Patrick, you can answer this one first, feel that this is indeed a trend? Why is this happening? And whether or not it's a good strategy for funders to use is that sort of pre-selection process rather than the sort of open grant process. Have you seen it? Do you feel like the trend? Oh, geez. I'm, I might not be the best one to answer that. Um, I don't think so. Sorry. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, I, from the private philanthropic side, um, we, we typically we, we wouldn't engage in, in such a process. I know um, with the William Penn Foundation mm -hmm. in, in Philly, um, the city of Philadelphia is about to embark on a half a billion dollar effort in investing in uh, its civic assets, and they did go through, uh, you know, kind of a RFP for for project users. Um, so, if that's kind of aligned with what your question is, uh, I would encourage you to kind of research that. But I can't think. I'm sorry, I can't think of a private foundation that that goes through that that process. Sorry. Yeah, that's not a trend as I see it. All right, well, we shall move on. Patrick, I think if you had to go, that's fine. Sorry, thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Patrick. Okay, thanks, Patrick. Okay. Uh, so I'm almost over anyway. <laughs> so moving along, uh, this one's another one, uh, probably a quickie uh, for you, Francis. Uh, can community foundations manage endowments for nonprofits? Absolutely. And okay. in fact, that's one of the um, ideas we're to toying with is having a process for nonprofits to place a portion, uh, place some savings with us, and we would match it dollar for dollar um, to help nonprofits uh, establish and grow their endowments. It may be a competitive process. We may need, uh, we may be include some technical assistance in there to help nonprofits build their endowments, uh, which would also help with individual giving, you know, major giving, uh, major donor fundraising. So that is an idea that we have, but absolutely that's another way to encourage donors to feel that their, their dollars are going to be well managed in perpetuity. So, so if comes your nonprofit might go away one day, believe it or not. Hard to believe, but it might. Well, it won't, it won't go away unless the board makes a determination it will go away. And in situations where nonprofits decide to go away, they take a lot of time and effort in deciding what to do with their funds because under Pennsylvania you can't uh, divert the objects to which uh, tribal contributions are donated, devised, or granted. Uh, you can't, you can't, if a donor gives you money for a certain purpose, 
you can't change that purpose unless you get the Orphanage Court approval. And the Orphanage Court, the Orphanage Court won't approve that unless it's impossible and practical fulfillment, such that it's for di I was just dealing with this. It's for diabetes, but there's no more diabetes. Uh, then, wouldn't that be wonderful? The, you have to go to the Attorney General and the Orphanage Court, and you try to find through Cypre something as close as possible to that. Otherwise, they don't allow it. Um, but, but how would you, if, if someone's going to give you an endowment, how are you going to match? How are you going to come up with matching? Pro I mean, we might use some of the funds that we inherited to match them. Really? To encourage the... And, and I, donors, cause I find donors, as I think as you all recognize, donors are, are restrictive as to their funds. They really are. They want their names on it. They want certain programs. They, they want a villa constructed to hold their paintings. Uh, they want, they want uh, it's, it's so many things they want. And it's okay. Donors can place restrictions on contributions as long as it doesn't freely and effectively affect the charity from engaging in its charitable purposes. So if you say, hey, I want you to build this plaza, and I want you to name it for me, that's okay. You can't say, I want you to build this plaza and let IBM use it to run this, you know. But, but you know, okay. But, but so we might use a portion of our fund rate, our right. grant making dollars to build, help nonprofits in the community build yeah. endowments. A recent study that the Philadelphia Foundation commissioned with GuideStar and another firm was looking at the health of nonprofits throughout the Philadelphia area. And it won't surprise you to hear that many nonprofits are really operating at the margins and some very much in the red. So we have some really wonderful nonprofits in our community. We have some significant needs. We want those nonprofits to be around for a long time. Okay. So we'll be looking at capacity building. You know, do you need help investing in a development staff person or a communication staff person? Do you need some succession planning? Should you be exploring partnering with another nonprofit that does similar work? where money is getting in the way of you even beginning to have those conversations. Some of you may be doing very, very well, but you need a stronger cushion behind you, and you need to send a message to your donors that you are going to be around for the long haul. So starting to set aside endowment funds might be a good idea for you. And if that's something we can help you with, if you strategically have decided that's your next step, then that might make sense for us to work with you on. But again, this is one of the ideas that we have on our plate right now, I'm not making any commitments, but it's worked well in some other communities where foundations have really invested in capacity building and strengthened the nonprofit community in their area, and that's one of our jobs, we, we believe. Yeah, 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 I think of it, I mean, I, I query whether if, if I'm a donor and I'm setting up a donor advice fund, more and more in relation to or in connection with donors wanting to keep their own investment advisors, these donor advised funds are becoming close to private foundations. For instance, Fidelity, Vanguard, if you have enough money, they'll let you use your own investment advisor, which kind of flies in the face of a true donor advised fund, but they'll let you do it. Would, would you let someone do it? We're actually exploring that. The Chester County Community Foundation has a what they call their medallion program where you come and you bring assets to us, but you don't want um, yeah. You know, what, who would be an advisor? I mean, I'm, it's all coming at Hurdle Callahan, whoever. And you don't want to lose them. You're still placing the funds with us. They're on our books. They're treated as a donor advised fund or a restricted fund of some type. But you get to continue to use your advisor. They have to yeah. meet, they have to go through a due diligence right. process and meet a certain set of requirements to be included, but it's worked very well for, right. in fact, I would say about half of the funds that the Chester County Community Foundation has right now are managed separately by other outside but, but advisors. Independent, yeah. And, and I was in a situation where, so, so this is a question, is a nonprofit going to take its endowment and move it, and is it beneficial? So. I had two supporting organizations, one for the Annenberg School at Penn, one for the Annenberg School at USC. They had $300 million in it, which seems like a lot of money. I was going to say not to Josh, but I did say it. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, he, he's just, you know, he's from D.C., and, you know, it's a small change to him. I'm sorry. So, so the treasurer of the Annenberg Foundation said, that's not enough to diversify. $300 million is not enough to diversify. We can't diversify. We can't get hedge funds. We can't do this. We can't do that. It's 300 million. So we actually transferred the money to the endowments at Penn and USC. We've got a private letter ruling, and it's public. So we transferred and we invested in the endowments of Penn and USC because they've got 
they've got seven, eight million, uh, eight, eight to seven billion dollars. Yeah. So there was a real advantage of us putting our 300 million and diversifying it with a seven, eight billion dollar foundation. So it, it, it's a good question as to, as to whether you should transfer your endowment, which you control, to another organization. And if you're going to do that, like we have an investment agreement, we can get it back anytime we want. The results have been pretty good. Um, it's just, you know, it is your endowment as a nonprofit, unlike an individual, it's got to go to a charity. Yours is already in a charity. So I'm not saying, um, I'm saying you should consider, it's certainly uh, worth consideration transferring to Chrysler Chester for, especially when you finish your deal and it's, it, you have other assets and, and they're diversifying. But, you know, it's just, 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 just food for thought about, you know, how to diversify the assets and whether it makes sense. There's something called the Common Fund, which is for educational organizations. They have billions of dollars for educational organizations that they, even the Annenberg Foundation invested in it, where they uh, diversify and sub-account. And it makes sense because uh, they're, they're diversifying with a huge amount. Um, so there's, there's, there's so many, and there's up MIFA. It's so funny, the uh, Uniform Prudent Management of Institutional Funds Act is enacted by every state in the Commonwealth of, in, the, in the United States, except for one state. What's that state? I'm not sure. Oh, I'm sorry. It's, uh, I thought you knew. It's, uh, it's uh, my bad. Uh, Pennsylvania. <laughs> We're the only state that doesn't have it. It's, it's, it's incredible. So. Um, so, so you just have to watch out. And inve investing funds is tough, and now the IRS says you can do emission investing, so you can make an asset, you can make a, 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 an investment that furthers your mission, even and, and, and it still meets the prudent investor standard of Pennsylvania statutes. It's just it's just gotten very 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 complicated. And Milton Hershey, the Attorney General, told. The Milton Hershey School, you got to sell your Milton Hershey, your Hershey Food Corporation because you got too much. But they didn't take into account the diversification statute, uh, applicable to nonprofits. It wasn't enacted until 30 years after Milton Hershey gave the Hershey stock. They said he would have ha had to be clairvoyant that there'd be a diversification statute. Because if he was clairvoyant, he would say, notwithstanding any diversification statute, is my intention and goal that they retain these funds. It was just very bizarre. And that was the Mike Fisher running for governor. It was a huge thing that ended up in legislation in Pennsylvania, if you look it up. We have legislation that says, if a charitable trust owns a controlling interest in a public company, it can't sell the stock unless it goes to the attorney general. It's just so, such a bizarre legislation. It's just, you know, these issues are just incredible. So you can't, you can't take them too lightly. So, uh Richard, we have a couple questions people have been asking about the EITC or OSTC, and that is the Educational Improvement Tax Credit or the Opportunity Scholarship Tax Credit. Uh, the question is specifically, how can we as nonprofits leverage EITC, OSTC, when many companies consider the process of becoming eligible complicated and overly burdensome? Either or? Yeah, yeah we, we have a lot of clients who use the uh, EITC. Um, it, it's a great program. Uh, it's been extended for years and years and years. It is a very competitive program. So it's a great program because you're involved in scholarships, education. The Philadelphia Zoo has it. Um, so if you can find if you can find a donor who wants to help you, you tell them, hey, if you commit for one year, 75 percent. Uh, of your contribution uh, is a reduction of your t of your personal income tax, your corporate income tax. So it doesn't. If you do it for two years, they get a credit of ninety percent. So they're giving you ninety percent, basically, basically for free. Well, it costs you ten percent. It costs them ten percent. So it is. It is. It is a great program. I would Google Pennsylvania Education uh, um, Improvement Tax Credit and the scholarship credit, and it gives you all the parameters when you have to apply. It is really competitive. You have people standing in Harrisburg, you know, with their packages, you know, trying to get it ready. But, but it is really popular, and it gets, but the thing is, you have to find a donor that pays those types of taxes, otherwise it's meaningless to them. I see. And the city of Philadelphia, actually my old law firm did an economic development uh, grant where we save dollar for dollar the uh, the city the city tax net profits tax. So there's, there's a lot of there's a lot of taxes out there that you can save um, for your donors. So you can say to your donor, hey, give us the money, and it's not going to cost you anything because it's going to reduce your taxes. Yeah. And if they want to support you, it can really. But it's really you're saying that it's really got to be in that sort of threshold of like they got to really be able to take advantage of that tax benefit. I yeah, mean, to yeah. A lower it's net not, worth. It's not going to be ten bucks, or it's got to be. 
Uh, I think the limit may be 100 grand. Okay. So, so my firm did 100 grand. <coughs> and don't you have to be eligible? Don't, doesn't the nonprofit first have to apply and be accepted by the state? Yes. yes. So and you have to I be, was familiar yeah. with a group out in Coatesville that never got accepted. Yeah. The paperwork just got bogged down and yeah. it didn't go anywhere. It was very frustrating. You got to be accepted <coughs> as an education group and tax credit group. <coughs> and then you have to get the paperwork done and you got to get the paperwork early because there's only a certain amount of funds that are allocated to exactly. that program. And it's going to and and spin out. Yeah. You got to market it. If you can so. find a donor, it's an easy sell. Yeah. It's just got to be for the for the right donor, though. So for the right donor who's paying the taxes. Yep. yep. And if they want to support you, it's 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 a virtually almost uh, it's, it's kind of a no-brainer. Yeah. Well, I mean, it doesn't cost very much money. Yeah. And if they want to support you, um, so so check it out. I want to get uh, one more. Well, we got probably time for maybe two more questions or so. Uh, I want to throw one down to you, Josh, on the end. Uh, so this is sort of out there to the individual. Um, you got a great idea. Um, say you kick something to the Knight Foundation for a grant. Maybe you're thinking about starting up a uh, Indiegogo or a Kickstarter or something like that. Um, what kind of tax implications for an individual? I mean, say you don't have a nonprofit. You just got a really good idea. What do you got to think about in order to get yourself off the ground from a tax standpoint? Right. So uh, I think the first thing you're going to want to think about really for an individual, um, so you don't really have that up and running operation, but you want to start raising money for a good cause is just you want to find a good advisor and meet with them to kind of talk through uh, whether you would want to stru structure some sort of entity to raise funds. Uh, but if not, I think kind of like what we've talked about earlier, finding a, a partnership with an established organization might be a good idea because people are going to be more comfortable Let's say you start up your own crowdfunding page because um, a family friend or someone really could use help or a cause you really believe in. You're not a charity, um, but you want to raise money for it. I think it's good to affiliate with a charity. And sometimes some of these crowdfunding platforms actually require you to have a charity. And so I, I think one good idea to inspire people to give to your cause is maybe structured so that there's a floor where, uh, let's say, if $10,000 are raised, then you're going to fund that project. But if you don't hit that fund, or you don't hit that, that measurable level, then no, char no cards get charged and all the money goes back. So I think that could be one way good for someone who's just an individual trying to, to pursue a good cause, can kind of start their own organization without all of that, you know, kind of additional running yeah. up things. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Okay. Uh, so I think a good last question we can end things on, um, relevant to where we are. How can, and this is probably for you, uh, Fran. Uh, how best can educational institutions in the area engage with community foundations in both partnerships and in their fundraising, i.e. grants? So, you know, is there anything besides just that sort of, you know, applying for grant funding that, you know, an uh, educational institution can look to to partner with a nonprofit foundation or a community oh, foundation? I, I, just starting with a conversation, uh, helping us understand who you are, helping, you know, you understand who we are. Um, uh, I think it's conversation. I, 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 don't, I don't know any other way around it. For all our talk about technology and crowdsourcing, and, and it's really all about relationships and us having a conversation um, and understanding what your priorities are, you making the case for your support for whatever it is the project are that it is that you're thinking about, uh, us um, explaining what our priorities are. You know, you may have the most compelling project in the world, but it may not fit within, yeah. it may not fit within our giving priorities. Then again, we may be sitting down with a donor who's interested in, and it's about matching, you know, you know, I mentioned in my comments about the family that's just set up a donor advice fund with us, and I'm already in my conversations with people in the back of my mind, she shared with me what their interests are and what their teenagers interests are and I'm already starting to think about who are the organizations in the community that I can match up with for them. Um, a lot of the work I think you know the, back to, to Nancy and I know she had to leave but her question you know fundraising sometimes you, you what's really challenging and I've been on your side of the, the those of you who are fundraising I've been on your side as well you have these immediate operating needs. You've got to make budget. And yet, a lot of fundraising is long term. You know, it's about, you know, it may not pay off. Like, you know, I'm thinking of some conversations Joe and I had from Widener about we were talking about a specific scholarship, but it's about a long term conversation. Uh, you know, getting to know each other. And then as we evolve, 
having in the back of my mind what's going on at this institution and saying, oh yeah, we had that conversation, let's circle back because now the opportunity pr presents itself. It doesn't help with your immediate budget goals, but you just never know in the long run it could result in something much more significant. Yeah, and many, many times, like Thomas Jefferson University, they have over 100 development people mm -hmm. In, in, in their group. My daughter is one of them. Okay, so they got, and, and University of Pennsylvania. I, I don't know how much help they need from the CUNY Foundation, but one thing I find is that um, donors want to make sure that if they do want to support a college, I mean, they could, get, they could give it to the college as an endowment, but I've, I've found donors that have given endowments to universities and have not been totally satisfied. Uh, remember the Robertson case? Uh, yeah, versus Princeton. Princeton, I yeah. think the ending, I, I, unfortunately I wasn't a lawyer, it was like $100 million of legal fees, which is the worst. Um, <laughs> so, so instead, I had a client who set up all these endowments, hundreds of millions of dollars of endowments, and said, you know what, we're not going to give them an endowment, we're going to set it up as a supporting organization. So the contrary is, let's give it to a community foundation, say, you know, we want to support this program at the university. And the university doesn't control the assets, I'm but Francis okay. does through her organization, and they can make sure that the goals of the donor with respect to furthering the educational mission are furthered, and not just leave it in the hands. Like Princeton yeah, took, it it took like $50 million for things unrelated to Woodrow Wilson School of Government, which is the whole point of the Robertson Foundation. Right. So it, 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 it provides some layer of protection yeah. to put it with a third party. And you may not want to do it as a supporting organization, which is very complicated and very expensive, and you could do it very I would cheaply. just like to go on record that this is the first time I have met Richard. I did not ask him to say all these wonderful things about yeah, community yeah. foundations, really. No, Francis's cards are available uh, at the front <laughs> here as well. No, I'm, a big, I'm a big fan. Of, I've used community foundations over and over, even to the extent of not having a client, because I'd rather the client be served well over time I've been in karma, and, and that the, I find the community foundations do a good job. And why not use them if they can do a good job, cheap, and like I said with that newspaper, the next day they're running an ad. Fill up a Haiti Relief Fund, you know, to, to set up a 501c3 and a board, it would take forever. Yeah. Well, I think that does it, guys, from a time perspective. Thank you so much to our panelists, guys. Really appreciate it. Our pleasure. Thank you.